Well, nice to see you again, Yom. Uh, we're talking about Hannon Metals here today. Hannon is a, a company that, that I co-founded uh, back uh, in 2015. It had a couple of years in Ireland and hence the name. Uh, Paddy Hannon came from an island, from a town where we had an office called Quinn. And Paddy Hannon is known to have actually left Ireland in you know, the 1880s or something like that. And, and he made the discovery of Kalgoorlie, the Golden Mile in, a, in Australia, Australia's largest gold discovery. And, uh, and then he, uh, he made that discovery and, and then he actually died in Melbourne and he's in the Melbourne Cemetery, which is where I live here. So a very famous man I followed from his hometown and knew some of his uh, descendants in, in that town and, and uh, a great discoverer. And so hence the name, which, uh, we, which we, we've put and badged uh, with, with uh, honour onto this company. We left Ireland uh, in about 18, um, towards the end of 2018. It was a zinc, zinc lead uh, silver uh, exploration there. And, and that, that just became a little tough in, in terms of the market. And, and then we went and, and started looking in Peru. I've had a very long history in Peru and uh, we can talk about that later, uh, but uh, a very data-driven uh, history and, and work for a major there through the 1990s. And, and Hannon is a result of having discussions with a number of my colleagues a, a number of years ago saying, where can we make the big discoveries? Where in the world can we go and make these big discoveries? And you tend to go to places, at least my stage of life, that you know very well. And, and so Hannon is a result of a, a thesis uh, to, to go and make those big discoveries. And, and that is in the back arc uh, or over the Andes in the high jungle in Peru. We're looking where few have before when I was there in the 1990s. It was, it was uh, quite a hard place logistically. It was full of the drug cartels at the time. That's 20 years old, that story now. But, uh, but it's a relatively un well, completely unexplored part of the world. And so we're taking the big swing in elephant country. And that's what I look forward to, to showing you here. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're doing, it, it is a copper gold focus. We have we have a number of key projects. We're one of the largest landholders in Peru, and we've got two key projects that you can see up on that top right of the slide. We have Valiente, which is a hundred percent owned project, and there's up to eighteen porphyries in a new porphyry copper gold. Um, these alkalic porphyries, so they, they're the copper gold variety, uh, where all the major gold companies are going to get their ounces these days are into these into these uh, alkalic porphyries. Uh, we've got surrounding scans and epithermal targets that go for kilometres. This is a this is a, a hundred kilometre long, one hundred and fifty kilometre long new uh, belt. Uh, we also have a sediment hosted copper. So the second most prolific style of copper in the world is, is sediment hosted, very much like the Kufa Schiefer in, in Poland, um, close, to, close to you. And, and we have a joint venture with the Japanese government in Jogbek there. Uh, and so two very different uh, projects. The J, it's a JV with Jogmek, where they're, they're earning 75%, spending 35 million. And um, and the first step is for them to get the fifty one percent and spending eight million US and they're sort of they're they're halfway through that um, earning great partners very solid and and uh, consistent to to the the business of exploration. Um, so they're the two big targets that we're focusing on. We still do have some of the projects in Ireland, but literally we're, we're keeping those warm um, should there be a, be a change in the market for lead and zinc. Some very compelling targets there, but nothing compared to what we're doing in, in Peru. And, and Peru is very hard to, to permit. We just, this, is, this project, this company has been trying to uh, get drill permits for the last two to two and a half years. And that's a standard time in Peru, so it's not as if uh, we're an ex exemption uh, to the rule, but uh, but Peru is very been, been very slow to permit, and 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 that's that's been the tough thing. We know we've got great projects. We know we've got more porphyries than 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 uh, many of the majors in terms of exploration, 
but uh, in targets. But uh, we we we've been waiting to to permit. We just got our first permits uh, in January, so that's where the momentum of this company is just starting to go. Uh, we also have a very low cost exploration uh, project uh, under the Pampa, so under uh, cover in Chile. That is drill almost drill ready and we've just done some geophysics there but that's a few hundred thousand dollar expenditure there and we got that project in as we were waiting for projects in peru just to try and keep the momentum um and uh and that this slide's a little bit old drilling in ireland chile and peru 2023 that will be definitely 2024 um that uh, should be say there uh, in chile and peru will be drilling over the next three three months uh, and and once we get that, we've got many drill permits coming to the table. Um, so we've got the first one, and we've applied for another, and and uh, we've got another two in the two in the uh, two drill permits that take two years in in the system. So once we we've got that first one, we'll get the next one, the next one, and we'll start to have these chain of drill permits testing all these targets. Another key point is that we have tech at nine point nine percent as a shareholder really interesting that we've never drilled a hole in in Hanan in in Peru today and and we have the Japanese government and Canada's largest mining company supporting the concept and the targets and the projects that we've we've defined and that's just where copper is going right it's very hard to find new copper projects and certainly new belts in themselves and and so we're doing something very different and I think that's recognized by the partnerships that we have this is uh, this is just the cap structure. You can see the shares on issue uh, around about 109 million shares uh, today. A market cap of around 30 million Canadian, with a couple of million bucks in the bank as of the last quarter. Uh, our our burn rate is around about a million bucks on that 100 percent a million bucks a year on that 100 percent owned property Valiente Jogmec spends 2 million US a year, but that's 100% their expenditure. And then it takes about half a million to, to run the company uh, around all of all of that. So it's about a one and a half million buck a year expenditure ourselves with another two and a half million, now that's Canadian, with another two and a half million US coming from, from Jogmec. You can see the momentum has come in the last uh, literally days on the stock price um, from where it's just been tracking sideways. I've always said up until this point, Hannon was a company to put in your buy and put in your top drawer because the permitting timeframes were long, but the targets and the the uh, the opportunity was large. You know, there's literally 18 soul goals, if you like, hidden in any one of those porphyries, should they have the grade and 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 be drill successes. So, so uh, with that momentum and the drill permits, we're starting to get a bit more uh, uh, traction, perhaps, uh, from from the market. So we got 16 or nearly 1700 square kilometers of land. It puts us in the top 10 landholders in Peru. Uh, this, this company came about, as I said, as we were morphing out of, of Ireland, we kept on working in Ireland, but we went to Peru in uh, early 2019. Uh, and, and really it, it was a function of, we went into the, the, the sediment hosted uh, copper system, which we call San Martin, the JV with Jogmec, and and delineated that during 2019. And then we did the deal with Jogmec and we said, well, where are we going to go? Um, we need projects in our own right. Um, we can talk about it, but uh, since the mid 1990s, um, you know, we've had the database of a major that we worked with in the day. And so that's been in our head. And we, we did a deal with the receivers back then. And uh, packaged up that data and, and and sold it to 30 plus majors um, who were working in South America. And of course, so we've had the data resources of a major uh, for you know 30 years in, in that part of the world. And there's no publicly available data, not like Sweden or Australia or uh, many of the places in which we work where we where explorers we work and then we hand in annual reports with all our data. That doesn't happen in Peru. So so the, the the JV ground in 2019 and then 2020 that as we all remember was uh, as when was when COVID hit but it gave us such a great moment to get out there with geologists on the ground and just let them wander in the bush <laughs> where they're able to work and um, and we had some very 
very experienced uh, porphyry geologists who you know can pick up a little bit of rock and one here and know where it sits in the whole system of a porphyry that if you understand the architecture of a porphyry you can actually place where a little rock can sit and then you can obviously target to where the, the mineralization may be we did a lot of the stream sediment work so captured the stream sediments over that 150 kilometers the red is in our 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 ground there on that map um, and and you can see the main area is is even where Antamina is showing that's maybe 50 to 60 kilometers to the west that's the main sierra or the the mountains and you go off and you come into our ground and it's still you can see the backdrop of some uh, imagery there still mountainous but much lower sort of the thousand meters rather than the four and a half thousand meters and uh, and certainly uh, the 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 rain hits that part of the world so it's 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 jungle territory so challenging to explore so we did a lot of that base work that you know you you never really want to promote because it's unpromotable doing stream sediments and mapping but it's the foundation to finding big systems and then we flew uh, in 2022 the area that big area with aeromagnetics um, and and these porphyry systems and epithermal systems are very variably magnetic and that was a, a, a ground breaking piece of data also and then uh, in 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 uh, the sediment hosted system we flew uh, lidar through thick jungle so we've been and I'll show you an image of that so we've been really collecting large data sets to make large discoveries in places where nobody has explored before so I'm, I, I've, I've sort of gone into the preamble so just uh, this slide repeats it Valiente 100% owned San Martin in the middle JV with Jogmec and and then the peripheral projects that we're spending very little amount of money on um, but still we'll see low cost drilling in in Chile and and I've talked to you about the investment thesis uh, and uh, and and what we're doing uh, in terms of you know looking for big discoveries in areas that people haven't looked with and the the, the partnerships that we've 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 got in that part of the world. So just looking at Valiente um, itself, you know, a lot, lot of ground, you know, the 1600 uh, square kilometers there, um, 18 different porphyries, and we're sequentially knocking off the areas where we've gained social license. And we haven't touched on that, but social license in new areas where people haven't been exposed to companies like ourselves before takes a lot of work. So it's going in there in 2020, uh, and with just a couple of geologists and 21 with more geologists and social licensing teams and then a lot more effort in 22 and then 23 was when we started to really work these projects and now all of a sudden we're here in 2024 and we're starting to get drill permits but uh, we've had a lot of time working with the local people and 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 if if discoveries are made here and books are written that will be the the key breakthrough is actually just getting the trust of the local people and I'm not talking only about the people who live in these areas but I'm talking about the people that uh, are working in the regional authorities and the, the municipalities etc not not absolute not wherever you work you don't get absolute support but we do have the support and that's how we're getting our drill permits and and uh, you know we've had some surreal times where we've had uh, you've got to get uh, public participation meetings to get these drill permissions through and uh, or even just to to to, to, uh, to apply for the drill permission or submit it and we've had you know 160 people in these meetings and they've come there with banners saying we want the Canadians basically um, this being a Canadian listed company of course and 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 go away any NGO who's going to oppose it uh, and and that comes with trust and and credibility that kind of relationship this is this is uh, the the stars are the porphyries that we've identified with more data and rigor. So those that we've mapped in detail and sampled at surface. There's a lot of detail here. I'll let Lars get into the absolute detail around the porphyries. But one of the other key things that we've been able to do is that we've been able to date through radiometric dating, which basically is a technique that can get us within you know, a, a very small range of when a mineralization event and we find minerals that are associated with the, the mineralization and we can date 
those those events and and these come back at a a time which about 12 to 20 million years ago which seems a hell of a long time to most people but it's very recent in geological past and 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 that's what we call a miocene event or miocene uh time and and the the mineralization event occurred at that moment now that's one of the key windows one of the the fertile times when a lot of the my the miocene porphyries were developing through the andes it's a really rich time in the earth's development through when when that subduction was occurring at the andes Miocene porphyries are meant to happen close to the, the where that subduction is happening. So we get the oceanic crust going under the continental crust, and the continental crust forms the Andes. And so we've got this big high uh, mountain range, and and the porphyries, uh, Miocene porphyries, are meant to happen close to that subduction front. We're getting these things way out here in the back arc, is what we call it, and uh, they sh they shouldn't be there. So we're actually rewriting. The history of the Andes in many respects, and it's probably because there's some, you know, if we think of the Andes heading in, in a north-south ridge, there's probably some very major transfer structures crossing the Andes that are bringing these Miocene porphyries, these younger porphyries, so east. Um, but they are there. There's 18 of them at least that we've identified, and and here's a seven of them that we've named and got uh, lots of samples, and we we we're um, where we've just started to, we've got the DIA, the, DIA, the, the, the Declaration Impacto Ambiental, which is like an EIS for drilling in the bottom three. Uh, that's over about a 10 kilometer trend. That's what we call the Balin area. Um, and it's got the three projects, Ricardo Herrera, Vista Alegre and Sotalecchio. That's already been applied for that, that DIA. So that's in the system and we're waiting for that to be granted. Um, and we're working towards DIAs here in Divisoria and, and Previsto. Previsto is what we really like. So keep your eyes on the Previsto area. We only gained social access to Previsto over the last three or four months. And, and notwithstanding the great results at Balines, and there's a big porphyry there with the gold shedding off three kilometers off that porphyry and scans wrapping around that porphyry. There's a hell of a lot and two porphyries actually in that bottom left, but we really, really, really like the, that Previsto area. And, um, and we've just started to go in there over the last few months. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of a, a teaser, I suppose, for where Lars will come in. And this is just uh, the area in that, that Balin area down in the bottom left of, of that last image. We're now looking at those those areas. And again, I won't go into too much, but you can see Ricardo Herrera and, and Sotalecchio are the two bookend porphyries. Um, and around those, you get the scans, which are the, the carbonate rocks that form bodies of mineralization that around the, the annulus of the porphyries. And then the Vista Alegre targets three kilometers of gold anomalous gold shedding off a, a ridge there um, and and we've done IP at uh, Ricardo Herrera and, and that will be on the next target lots of copper and gold coming out of the system at surface not a drill hole yet but the the DIA has been applied for and that's where we had all the local people um, with the sign saying we support you uh, on this project uh, so that's that's a little bit of detail here's Here's the uh, IP. It's how you charge the ground up and you turn the charge on and off, and 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 then you measure the residual charge that's left in the ground. That's called charge ability IP induced polarization and the chargeability. And and if there's disseminated sulfides, they'll have a remnant charge held longer than rocks without the disseminated sulfides. And so the red is the high chargeability. You can see we've got big blobs underneath that uh, that uh, uh, Ricardo Herrera area, and there's something like of chargeable rocks. There's something like six or seven hundred million tons of chargeable rocks. We need to drill it to see what the grade is, but uh, you know if the if the grade is there, then this is a this is a big system. Um, certainly, there's grade at surface, but we're only seeing in these tropical environments very leached 
uh, leached number. So the weathering takes away a lot of the metal and leaves us with remnant metal because of the weathering. So it's very hard to say what we have at surface um, uh, will it would certainly won't relate to what's down there. It should be higher when it's down there, but without drilling, we 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 won't know that. So a a, a big target in itself. Only one of the eighteen porphyries. Now we're just going to go to a very different area. Um, we're going to go about 250 kilometres to the north to San Martin, which is still in that back arc, but we call it the Foreland Basin because it's the younger rocks. And, and here we have uh, the, se the sediment-hosted copper. So it's basically um, very different. The porphyries are big intrusive rocks that bring these copper-rich fluids the, the, the sediment-hosted systems are more like pancakes. They form in a horizon. Uh, we have the Kufa Schiefer that uh, averages one to two metres thick in Poland. It's one of the most prolific copper belts in the world. The Central African Copper Belt is another one of these massive examples, but they're so continuous over tens and tens and tens of kilometres, and, and they can be mined with that continuity. We, in this area, have a zone that's continuous over... Um, you know, literally, we've seen you know, the copper horizon exists over 120 kilometres, uh, and in one detailed area that we're looking at part of in this image, which I'll explain in a moment, we have um, about 12 kilometres where we know the horizon where we see it at surface averages about one metre thickness and 2% copper um, with about an ounce silver. So, certainly, there's a lot of metal in the system. The challenge for us here will be able to find uh, these areas that. Uh, are continuous with copper. Certainly there's copper all through there, but can we drill one hole here and one hole here and hit a continuous horizon? Um, and, and that continuous, that copper is uh, precipitated into the rock because the rock is full of carbon and the carbon acts as a reductant to drop that copper out. What we're looking at here is, is um, perhaps a, a 30 or 40 kilometre long strike on the image. It's LiDAR. So you have LiDAR on your phone and you can shoot uh, the LiDAR just shoots um, a laser out from a, a, a scanner and the laser hits the surface and bounce back and, and is received by the scanner. This, this is going through the jungle canopy and we get the, the last return is some of those few hits, like the, the scanners that we were using, um, we we're flying at 600 metres height out of aeroplanes. They were, they were literally emitting six, uh, half a million points per second from uh and and then we were getting the last return that mapped the ground through the forest um was about one point per two square meters so it's not very dense but it's enough to map and you can see the lines there all the different strata going up the hills and we could at, because we're looking for pancakes we can find a little bit of copper in one space and then we can trace that pancake along um, in in the LIDAR. So it's a fantastic piece of technology and you can see where the creek has gone through there. Uh, it's, it's offset uh, the, the layers and that's that's simply a fault that uh, that went through there and, and has dis disturbed the layers and the creek has subsequently utilised or the river has utilised that weaker rock. So great technology uh, to, to, to define these systems in areas that are challenging to look for. Uh, the other breakthrough in this project was, and, and I'm sure Lars will talk to it, but this is literally 150 kilometres from the bottom to the top there, and our uh, some of our tenements, not all of them, shown here. Uh, that's the seismics. So the, these these the, this area came about through um, Peru Petro, the government oil and gas company had released a lot of their data publicly that <laughs> never happened before, and we were able to map the rocks and you know they're quite you can see they're broadly quite flat with all the seismics and some of those seismic sections go down 25 or 30 kilometers we're only looking at the very uh, near surface in the top 500 meters but it helps us map and understand the rock looking for that right pancake layer over that larger area and and there's there's the, the about the meter at about 2.9 meters at 2% uh, copper and an ounce that we've been able to aver average over um, 120 channels over um, that, that, that core area. Um, so this is our current tenement position. Uh, we've got the DIA granted. So we got that first drill permit 
in this area called Tabalos, Tabalosus East. Uh, and that's where those 120 channels uh, with 0.9 average thickness at uh, 2% copper, which was very commensurate with what uh, the discovery of the Kufa Shifa was. Uh, our challenge here will be to find that continuity of the copper and uh, in a horizon that's not uh, cut up too much by faults. We do have other uh, areas. We've got uh, the rest of Tabalosos. The, 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 the horizon continues through all these areas. And, and, and one, one area that is really interesting is this Sorator area where we found a, a, a part of the stratigraphy that's 5 to 20 metres thick, so a lot thicker than we're seeing at Tabalosos East. And we've just announced uh, that those results where we're seeing um, you know, copper um, channeled, um, the best result in leached rocks, highly leached, again, the same jungle environment. We're seeing 5.8 metres at 3% copper and two ounces silver. Um, and that horizon is mineralized for over two kilometres. I like that target a lot because you can build up tonnages and it's not related to the, just the carbon in the rock. It's related to what was in the rock before we call it a sour gas, which is hydrogen sulfide that was in the rock that acted as a reductant. So a gas tends to form more consistently than the bits of carbon which have broken up plant material. So really, really uh, like the Sorator target and um, notwithstanding, we, we do like Tabalosos and we've got the drill permit here as the, one of the first drill permits. This is the first drill permit ever, um, a DIA to be granted out in these high jungle areas. So we really are breaking um, many barriers as we look into the areas that have never been explored before. Uh, the, the Cerro uh, Rolando properties in, in Chile, uh, in, in the Paleocene belt, it's uh, in, in northern Chile, it's around giants. Uh, it's just uh, uh, on the Pampa, which is out of the Andes, as all the sediment is shedding off the Andes. It forms, you know, up to hundreds of meters thick of Pampa. We hope it's not that thick. Uh, it could, it, uh, and that's what a lot of the geophysics has done to try and determine how thick the Pampa is. Um, we've got very uh, interesting conductors and magnetic targets that may relate to a porphyry. We're going to go in there and drill a 100-metre hole to see if we've got any enrichment above those magnetic and uh, electromagnetic conductors. And if there's an anomaly that we drill, then, then game on. If not, we'll simply walk away. So a, a, a very low-cost test, and um, that's the secret in exploration, is to turn targets over quickly uh, and, and as cheaply as possible. So in the land of giants, just a bit further, we use the same team and or, or the similar team, and we can... We can utilize, we're just across the border, but uh, something you can permit in in, uh, in Chile in about three months to drill. It takes two years in Peru, hence the, the logic of just expanding our search a little bit. And this is just a little bit more. I'm sure Lars will talk about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the conductors and the magnetic uh, targets that we've, we've identified in Chile. So just rounding up, uh, we've got our, f our first drill permits in the Jogmec JV area. We're spending uh, actually two million US. We hope the budget will be for next year. The end of the financial year in in uh, Japan is the end of March, so we're still yet to confirm that with Jogmec. So last year they had one point six Canadian uh, US, which was two million Canadian. Uh, so uh, first drill permits, new discoveries, that Sorator discovery that will work to mapping and doing a lot more work and get drill permits around that. Valiente, the first drill permit in, second one going in at Previsto. Um, we're working on that now. Really love Previsto. Uh, we'll be drilling probably in, in the Ricardo Herrera area next next year. Um, and and we'll have that, uh, the, the Peruvian say Gardena or the chain of um, porphyry targets that we'll be drilling. Uh, we have Tech and Jogmec uh, as our partners as uh, we're moving through this and, um, and, and then the, those other projects that I just mentioned. So a, a really exciting, true exploration company in its, in its truest sense, Jorm. But I guess we, we can start talking about the, um, the shareholders a little bit. So you said Tech had, had invested. Could you, could you remind everyone when that was and what was the rationalization for them to go in? They like the scale, they like the ideas, they're probably familiar with you somehow. Can you explain what, what was uh, the setup? Yeah, so 
We got we got a lot of interest early on because uh, when I say early on, maybe 2020, 2021, when we're starting to open up the Valiente area. We'd done the deal with Jogmec very quickly, so the interest for the, the sediment-hosted copper was was uh, not on the table because we'd done that joint venture already. And we started to look, I mean, as an exploration company, you can't just operate with joint ventures in my view. You need to expose shareholders to the full upside a discovery can bring. And, and that's why we went looking for our own projects in 2020, 2021. And uh, it, it brought a lot of companies to the table and, and uh, most companies, and I did this when I was in my uh, work for 10 years for a major, it's their job just to learn what, what's happening and collect data. And and uh, and and actually, I got uh, a, a little fed up with people just, you know, literally uh, signing CAs, taking the data and having no intent. So we started to look for people who, who would be serious and we wanted to validate what we were doing in the company. We, we didn't want a joint venture. We, we, at this stage, wanted a partner in the company. And, and tech were just one of those companies, and there was a couple of them, but not too many, who said, yeah, okay, we'll sign a CA over the broader area and, and we'll, we'll acknowledge basically you are the first movers in this and we won't just limit it to the, the tenure that you have because you've got, the, you've got uh, regional data, be it the stream sediment data or the mag data. Uh, and, and then uh, they were very open to what, uh, what we were looking for, very commercial, and they just, they, you know, you'd have to ask them totally what uh, what uh, what their thesis or strategy was. But you know, you know, from our point of view, we know it was all around what we were doing, opening up a new porphyry copper belt, and um, and they just wanted to be involved at the very earliest stages. And that was maybe eighteen months ago, I'm guessing, so, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, we have to look back through the news flow. And uh, they've they participated in 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 a couple of races, one to enter, and then one they they topped up, and and um, they they appreciated the time frame back then. Uh, they know Peru; <laughs> they've got an office in Peru. They work in Peru, and and those sort of time frames didn't bother them. You know, the market wants to see drill holes, and you know we talked about Southern Cross, and we got lots of drill holes going there, and that's a drill dis driven discovery, and and this will be. At, uh, at, uh, at some point soon enough um, as, as we get those permits through. But, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how they came on. Um, they, they came and did their due diligence on the ground and did their due diligence on the social side of things, et cetera, to, to make sure we had the team uh, to, to manage all th those aspects and, and, um, and that they were as we were presenting them, I suppose. Going forward, are they in communication with you still, following closely, or what's the involvement? They have endorsed you again by topping up, as you say, but in the last, you know, you submitted the DIA. Did they reach out and, and check in what the timeline was? What's the ongoing? I mean, it's a big company with many investments. Yeah, you know, yeah so no, but they're, they're very... Um... It's quite a relationship that, you know, you have a relationship when you form these partnerships. And, you know, we don't talk to them weekly, but, uh, you know, I... I uh, I, I saw saw them re recently just uh, to say hello. Basically, everything's going well in in at PDAC, and then saw them in November before that. So I suppose that uh, uh, that's sort of the time frame. So every three months, maybe we catch up. Uh, and you know, they're not uh, they're not micromanaging. They've got faith in us as a team, but uh, equally, they you know they want uh, like any shareholder <laughs> updates and and uh, yeah. So it's it's that kind of relationship. They've got vast experience so uh you know they've they've helped us geologically um provided lots of you know uh technical references around these alkaline systems that we were learning about so they've been very good in that respect and you know i i, I do know a lot of people through tech now um i did um I had 10 years in a company that was very similar to Tech Kaminko, uh, was the peer at Tech Kaminko, and I was in another company called Pazminko. So we were the major base metal company. So I've known people from those days right through, and um, that's the benefit of getting old. You know, you know quite a few people, and people know you. And we should cover as well. I mean, so so the total company burn rate per annum. What would you say it is? And if you kind of roughly break it up. Yeah, about two million Canadian. Yeah, and and then, Canadian. and then and then Jogmec on top of that. So you know, Jogmec is is let's let's call it two million US. 
So, you know, 2.6. So we're spending about four and a half a year, which is about 30 to 40 percent hours, right? Hours. Right. And, um, budget. and uh, I mean, now you should be, I, mean, I think it was as of October, you had 1.6 million Canadian in the bank. So now it's uh, it's getting to a point where a race needs to, to take place. I, I take it here. I mean, I, I, I would presume that it would be um, after you've had a chance to, to do your, your drilling work that you've planned for now, uh, both in, yeah. in Chile and in, in Peru. Well, we, we'll get to, uh, we, we, the, the permit that we have for drilling is the big major one. We've got our DIA, like I mentioned, but we're still just going through a few uh, N permits that you need to get. You need to get the authority to work permit and you need to get the water permit. And they're, they're about uh, six weeks and four weeks respectively to get those permits. So the first one authority to work has been applied for. So we'd expect that within the next month or so. Um, and once we get that, we can start constructing the drill platforms while we apply for the water permit to use the water to drill with. And uh, and and we've got extensive hydrogeological studies. That, you know, there was, a, there was a, a dozen people who went through and, and uh, collected all the information and put the report together for that year. So it's quite, that's why it takes so long. It's such an extensive body of work. Um, uh, yeah, so we we will raise we're always we we're always raising money. We'll raise it from shareholders. That's the same story again in in Hannon as it is in Southern Cross. If you're not a shareholder, you won't uh, you won't participate. Uh, so please become a shareholder. And uh, and and uh, we we will raise some with some time this year. We have to right. Uh, and uh, and remembering the drill budget is not ours. It's coming out of the Jogmec budget side of the equation, so we don't have to fund that drilling ourselves. No, but, but I mean, just stuff. in terms of burn rates, it's six. You know, yeah, six. I, I'm yeah. not. I, I think I mean, it, many expenses materialize with the land holdings at some set points in time. I don't yeah, know. Maybe yeah. you can clarify when that is. It's at back half of the year. Mid, middle, middle of the year. So that's a chunky piece okay. of change too. So, so you know, yeah. Q, Q3 is probably the number. I know you, you push and you're very good at getting an, <laughs> the date out of me, but it's some, it's some time around then. We we're not in, you never want to raise when you need to. Um, but we also want to get closer to that, and you, you did touch on that. We want to get closer to those drill permissions, final, like literally rig going on the ground, and then that's a good time to raise because you raise and you give people the opportunity to benefit from the results of yeah. the drill program. Yeah, no, that, that, that uh, makes total sense. And then I always ask, how much of the company do you own? I know it's fourteen percent of of insiders and management. I will take yeah. it. You would be so about a quarter of that. that. About a quarter of that, because there's basically four of us who founded the company, and and uh, we 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 um we bought shares all the way through, and uh, we continue to fund the company. Um and um yeah, so it's 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 about three and a half or four percent something like that. I guess Lars, could you could you introduce yourself? Um to our investors and, and let us let them know how you got to know to Mike and you know your career so far. Okay, uh, well, my name is Lars Dolenborg. I've been working with Hannan since 2017. Uh, today, I'm the president of the company. Uh, I work intimately with our teams in South America, almost on a daily basis, even though I live here in, in, in Northern Sweden. Um, I've been working in South America for the first time, I think, in 2010 uh, for a year, I stayed there with my wife and we did some port for exploration in the southern port for a junior company. I've then been working in Scandinavia, in Europe, Ireland, um, Finland, uh, and now since 2017 though, back uh, in South America again. And uh, uh, it's it's a, a thrill to be working in an environment like that because the, the, the price and the things you can discover are so much greater compared to anywhere else on this planet. So uh, I'm very happy to be involved with this project and the company. Um, but I, what I'd like to cover here are two key projects. Uh, it's the San Martin project in Peru and then followed by the Valiente project also in Peru. Uh, and then we'll just touch briefly on the Cerro Rolando project in Chile. Why? Because uh, it's uh, going to be drilled in the next two, three months. And I think that's quite exciting. Uh, 
all targets we're looking at here are porphyry plays. Uh, uh, oh, no, sorry. All targets we're looking at here are copper plays. There are two porphyry plays and one sediment toasted copper play, which is the San Martin project. Uh, but we'll start with the Valiente, which we call our flagship project. It's 100% owned by Hannah. It's a new discovery we made ourselves, and we've submitted the first drill permit now in, in, uh, in January. Uh, one key thing for Peru, anywhere in the world really, but for Peru specifically, is the, the social permit. Uh, you can have a permit to, to have a mining license uh, from the government, uh, and that entitles you to the right of the area, but without the social work on the ground and the acceptance by the local uh, villages, uh, there's no long-term relationship. There's no way to get access to the ground and do proper exploration. Uh, that involves mapping sampling or, or taking out uh, uh, drill rigs into the field, right? So uh, everything we do is social permit first. And I, I think this slide tells a great story of what that means. It means engaging with the communities. Our geologists here are camping in villages. Uh, and during the evenings, uh, we play volleyball and soccer with, with, the, with the, the people in the villages and, and uh, engage with them and their activities. Uh, during Christmas festivities, uh, there's a big thing in Peru called chocolatadas, where you drink hot chocolate uh, and give away presents to the children. Uh, it's something we do uh, in all the areas that we're active uh, as well. And it means uh, information meetings in big formal meetings like the one you have here on the photo uh, and small informal meetings where we have representatives walking with people uh, walking with um, uh, local people looking at areas where we'll be working uh, explaining our activities uh, landholder by landholder or village by village uh, and that is a work that takes time but when you do it correct uh, it, it creates a good momentum for the company uh, on, on the right hand side here i've just highlighted uh, the Valiente project, the most northern port. Every polygon here you'll see, Gorham, is a, a village with an area of influence. Uh, so there's a village here, village here, 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 here. And they're colored to their uh, acceptance of our, of our field work. So we have written agreements and, and a very strong community support in everything here that is green. Uh, and in yellow, uh, the villages are not reacting our work but they're not accepting it either so they're they're just they want more time more information and uh, and yeah it's it's a process really uh, and in in red you have villages that are strongly against uh, our presence on the ground and that's why we're not doing any work but you can see it's a quite complex uh, social environment to be working in a project like this is 50 kilometers long just this project area here and there are many different uh, social factors to account for and I used to say that every village is their own universe. So the people here may be very different from the people here and so forth. Uh, the key thing for us in our social work is, is, is being transparent uh, and not giving false promises and explaining what, that we are a formal company that follows the laws of Peru, uh, that we are entitled to do the work we do. We're not contaminating anything. We're taking samples. We're conducting scientific studies. Uh, and and by doing that uh, over the last years, we've created a huge opportunity here in Valiente and, and each of these area, uh, three areas now, are now open uh, for field work with very strong acceptance by the local communities. So can I, can I tackle a, a few questions there? So what's the, these are different villages, but, but, but do they consider, or, or do, do they have, you know, separate cultures kind of, uh, even locally, that, that they have different uh, indigenous uh, uh, culture so what was the dividing factor there yeah you touched on an important subject there uh there are no indigenous uh, uh communities in the valiente project or any project that hanan has at the moment okay. uh so the the villages here are uh in in they are not they are kind of informal if you put it that way uh, there are boundaries, but these boundaries uh, are not always registered in the public uh, maps. Uh, so to discover uh, where the village of Ricardo Herrera, for example, which is located here, where is your boundary to the village of San Pablo, which is to the south here, and to the village of Topa here, you actually have to take the representatives out and go and say, well, our village stops by that creek, and it goes up to that mountain, and then it goes to that mango tree. 
uh, and you have to map it like that to understand and then you create that formal agreement with the villages okay that you're here well in when we're working in this area we will use local assistants that are belongs to to your community or village and when we go here we will work with uh, the other village uh, the cultures are very similar uh, within the different areas but they may have different interests economic interests they may have different uh, uh, leaders they change leaders every other year uh, and when they change a leader the 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 community may also change the opinion of your work so in that sense you have to start over again and explain so building long-term relationships with many people is important if you only build it with a leader uh, your alliance will become weaker but if you build it with a population in a village uh, your alliance will be broad and the next leader will also accept your work yeah, and and I guess so. Can you explain those that are not aligned currently with you? Obviously, you probably have tried, but why generally would that be? Is it just a natural? Uh, <laughs> some uh, will always be against. I guess it's just. Yes. A... It's it's the it's the way the world is, right? They will all they will. You never have hundred percent on your side. There will never be. Uh, it's it's. So, but the, generally, uh, there are other economic interests uh, from the leaders in the village. Um, I don't want to go into it in too much detail because uh, I'm relying on information that is not always public, and uh, and some some parts are probably rumors and some parts are, uh, are are true. But they generally have a different agenda how they want to make money in in that zone, uh, and. Uh, there could be that the villages uh, of an area like this in yellow, for example, they are they are pro our work, but the person who is uh, in charge of the village, he's aligned with another political party and he doesn't accept uh, a political party that is against mining in, 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 in Peru, for example, uh, and he doesn't accept uh, our agreement. So the, the people are for, but per, the leader is against. That's one scenario. Uh, other other just in generalizing not pointing in a specific village now but other uh could have uh, informal mining informal mining is a big problem in peru uh, because it uses child labor prostitution uh, and uh, it also uh, creates more environmental damage uh, and uh, it's very big in the south Andean zone uh, and some of these villages could have informal mining uh, that makes them less open to a formal company that are following the laws of Peru. But what we try to explain, Gorm, is that we are an opportunity, not only for a few individuals that are engaged in illegal activities, but we're an opportunity that creates a future for their children. Uh, because you have to remember that people here are extremely poor, uh, and uh, it's not uncommon that uh, there are analphabets uh, in, in, in some areas as well. So people see that, uh, and when you build that trust which takes time takes years uh, it opens up also the opportunity to work uh, and uh, investigate areas because everywhere we go we don't make discoveries right but we do research and investigate and that's important and and also before we go into um, the details of the, the various projects you have or or, or you know porphyry ideas and, and epithermal ideas you have what's the general access look like to the project can you explain like what's the nature of a drilling program on this license is it the same for all the areas or does it vary depending on where you're at it's a big package i guess well you're right it does vary a lot uh in the areas you see here is green which are focus areas for for the valiente project the access is good uh there's a road that you can drive with a volvo uh at least a volvo uh four-wheel drive um, <laughs> during the dry season. Uh, you can certainly drive it with a Toyota Hilux any time of the year. Um, and then from that end roll, end point of the road, it's it's a hike into the project area. And at the end of the day, you can hike back out. You can have rent a small house in a village like this that is located here, or you can go back to the town of where we have our office, which is called Tingo Maria, which is a two, two hours drive uh, or one and a half hours drive, depending on the traffic, to the west. Uh, the same thing goes for Divisoria and the Previsto area. And when we look at our other projects uh, in San Martin, uh, the same logic applies there. So these areas seem massive 
development during the last 20 years uh, in infrastructure uh, and not massive like the tunnels you create in Norway, but uh, before this was really remote. There was no road access or anything. You had to have helicopter programs. But we don't have to deal with that. We have uh, proper roles, <laughs> drivable roles with the Toyota Hilux. So you, you can drive, say, like 500 meters to five kilometers uh, in range of where you want to drill, then you carry the drills. I guess you explained to me last time, lightweight, and you assemble them on site, and then you drill, and then you go back. Yeah, Is that the general? exactly. Yes, that's that's how it works. Uh, so, and then, okay, go, go ahead. On. No, oh. I was, go on you first, and I'll see what you were. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it, I guess to clarify what that cost generally, I guess the, the cost should be generally kind of uniform throughout the the project. It's like two two fifty or three hundred bucks per meter with this kind of setup, or what, what's the cost come down to? Yeah, uh, that's that's spot on. Actually, uh, we're doing the, this exercise. Just completed it in San Martin, a similar environment, uh, similar distance to the to the project, and uh, we're getting an all-in cost for the drilling. Uh, that is uh, around uh, 250 US dollars per meter. Uh, so th it's a logistical exercise uh, with the, with the carrying in fuel, making it safe, environmentally safe, because there's always the risk of accidents uh, and safe for our workers. But it's it's uh, a relatively low cost uh, uh, way of doing it, whereas you don't need any helicopters. Yeah, but uh, but uh, bright side is that you can employ a bunch of locals uh, doing it too. So uh, I, I would take a good chunk of them. Absolutely, and and uh, it's interesting if you look at the the culture in Peru. But uh, in the mining law of Peru, uh, when you have a, a permit and when you are in a in a process of a drill permit, one part of the mining law and the regulation states that you need to make investments in the local communities. Uh, and that's because these areas are neglected by the regional governments. There are no one investing here. Uh, so they, they, those investments uh, could be win-win scenarios. It could be improving a role that the community wants to be improved, where you also want to have better access. Or uh, recently we made an investment. There's a river to the south here where they have a wire line, a vincha, um, so a zip line uh, where you go over. Uh, and that's been broken for decades, uh, but it's, it, the foundations are good. So we, our geologists, they wanted to be able to cross that. Our social team wanted to be able to cross it. And the locals wanted to cross it because they were shortcutting their traveling time. Um, uh, so we made a community agreement together with the municipality, uh, not Hannan investing here, but together with the municipality, we identified this need. And then we supported that investment and it created a win-win opportunity. So everything we do is creating an economic benefit in the zone, uh, and we try to identify areas where there's a win-win scenario. And and, and yeah, this discussion applies to San Martin as well. So uh, absolutely. It, and it's important it, it, to remember that yeah, we're not doing this to replace the this the the structures, the regional government, the municipality government. We're doing it together with these entities uh, to strengthen them and their investments in, in the region, but we're helping them. And it, uh, by that, I think it's also comes in in a very transparent way for everyone who lives in the zone. Okay, and, and I guess we can have this um, discussion here on this slide as well in terms of. Uh how the social licensing feeds into the permitting process and then we can get into the actual geology but let's just get it out, out of the way so yeah absolutely the, the absolutely permitting is a headache in peru generally speaking it's improving over time they want to accelerate it how does the social per, uh, how does the social aspect locally feed into the permitting how important okay. it is to yes. explain the actual Yes, you know, so we'll, we'll do it. There are different types of drill permits. We will only look at the drill permit that we're doing here in, in our projects at the moment, right? So we'll, uh, other companies may go through a different process or without the permits, so you just make that clear. And it may sound a lot easier, but what we have to de do here is, is specific for this project. Uh, and that's why we're doing it that way. Uh, because we're in the highland jungle, uh, the it's more environmentally sensitive. Uh, so we need to create a permit that is called a DIA. Um, and, and the DIA allows you to drill 40 platforms within an area. Uh, and we'll go through that and you'll look at our platforms and the drilling of the different targets. Uh, 
to get to that permit, we need to do uh, a, a, a land search. Who's entitled to the land? In the Sabandian zone, 90% of all the land is controlled by the government. In most scenarios, okay, good. We're only dealing with the government. The government is, is very open for investments in the country. They're supporting it publicly. They were recently PDAC saying, come and invest in, in Peru. And they're making changes to the legislations, as you said. But uh, the reality is that in Peru, a lot of poor people from the coast are moving into the highland jungle to make a better living. It's easier there. It's not a desert. Uh, uh, it's uh, they can grow anything uh, and and the climate is very nice and there's water everywhere about the water so uh, there are many informal possessors of the land they don't have the title but they are the they are the possessors they live there they have been living there for a generation many of them uh, and they come from uh, regions uh, so they have mining experience they have families in Cajamarca and all these different well-known regions of, of, of Peru uh, but uh, uh, they, they've come in there and, and to, to get the permit yes we need the approval of the government but also we need to have the social approval by the people who live there uh, even though they're not uh, the, the lawful or the rightful owners of the land they are the processors to do that uh, we need to have and a signed agreement with the village. The people of the village, they are very democratic, the villages that are looking. We can just make an example in, in this area here. We look at this village here. They will have an assembly with all the people, and there needs to be uh, the leader, and they, they all have to come there, and they will all have they will have regular meetings in the village. We have to wait for one of those regular meetings, but it could be every other month they will have an assembly like that. And they will have a discussion uh, if they allow Hannah to to do the first the field work, the Cateo Prospection, which means that we're only entitled to take surface samples and soil samples. And they approve that. And then it's also regulated. How much do we pay the, uh, the local uh, assistants that we employ from the village for how long time we will be working there? And prior to that, we've had information meetings uh, and, and uh, explanation of what the work we want to do. So they know us quite well before we get to that point. But that, that agreement exists with all these villages you see here in green. Second to that, when we're going through the DIA, uh, we need to have a, something called a public participation workshop. Then we need to explain exactly what we want to do, where we want to drill, Who's the landholder of that ground, or the possessor? Let's say the possessor. They could be private landholders as well. Uh, it's 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 all they're all some, but who's the possessor or the private landholder? We need to have the agreement from them, and we also have to have the agreement from the villages that are uh, in the area of influence of the program. So this could be along an access road, for example, because we're transporting there there in in the area of influence. So to get this DIA submitted. We first need to have a successful public participation workshop uh, and then a signed agreement from all the villages. Yes, we support Hanan in doing this. Uh, and uh, 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 then we take that. We also collect an environmental study uh, where we do baseline research of all the different plants and fauna in the region. Uh, we do an air study to see uh, what the quality of the air is before the program. We do a noise study. Um, and uh, we do a uh, archaeological study where we look for uh, any artifacts in the area. So all these different instruments uh, are being collected. We submit it into the D application, and then it's being evaluated by uh, the water authority, uh, the archaeological authority, uh, the agricultural authority. Uh, environmental flora and fauna and the mine inspectors so it's a, it's a very rigorous process that they go we go through to get this permit approved uh, and uh, that process should take on the paper six months but it takes 12 to 18 months sometimes two years as we saw in san martin there are companies that have been waiting longer so that's the risk in that permitting aspect there during that time, there could be observations that you need to reply to uh, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, but I think that that gives you the summary. That's the, the all the different steps we go through to get a drill rig on site in this project. Uh, well, as I said, I'm a geologist, so I love exploration. And and in a, in a way, this is a dream to be working in this project because of the the 
what, what yeah the, the opportunity to discover something new this project doesn't have any history of exploration as mike probably explained uh, and it's very exciting to uh, the things we're doing now in the uh, in, in the valiente project and for me everything is about context when you do geology you can you can go out and take a rock sample and, and it's a lot of copper but if it doesn't have context and 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 with context i mean uh, the alteration system is there, it, there's no uh, good anomaly in geophysics or things like that, it becomes less interesting or even uh, uh, yeah, it, it less important. But this project does have some context that is, uh, I think, uh, difficult to, to match with any other project I see in the, in the market space today that is held by a junior, if you put it that way. Uh, we discovered a new myosin porphyry belt, and that is important because porphyries are clusters they're like mushrooms in the forest and and they come up like clusters and um, they're controlled by really big structures in the crust those structures have been mapped since the 1940s they're really well known uh, but they're very subjective and and they're difficult to map you won't see them in when you're in the field but when you have satellite data it's easier this is in a good image from Richards in year 2000, where they've looked at Chile uh, and, and understood that, you know, these structures, northwest, southeast lineaments are really important. And when you have those intersection between these lineaments and the Andean north-south structures like this, that's where we start to forming giant porphyry clusters like Chuquicumata, Escondida. Uh, yeah, we can go down. Where's El Teniente? El Teniente should be here somewhere. Uh, if it wasn't well, there's a, a few of them. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It's to the south here somewhere. Yes. And then we have uh, a recently a cluster that was claimed uh, called Vicuña uh, that's controlled by the Lundin Group. Uh, and Vicuña is interesting because that's one of those areas where you can see that there is no structure here, but uh, the the fame, <laughs> the claim to fame in the Vicuña district, as I understand it, is that they uh, they had an idea that this is there's a major lineament going through here, and that lineament made them uh, over decades of time acquire a lot of ground in that area, and and as as uh, uh, time evolved and, and, and it was easier to explore. That's my interpretation of it. Uh, it was remote originally when they started, but today it, it's it's the new exploration front in Chile. Uh, they have discovered a new cluster of porphyries and, and some excellent uh, deposits. And, and it's, I'll highlight it here in, uh, this is from Next Gen Minerals, uh, Vicuña, and here you can see the cluster, which in a 15 kilometers radius. So that's really the important part. And I'm telling you this story because that's how we explore in Hanon as well. We're looking at these big lineaments uh, and seeing where, if we find a porphyry, uh, is it located along here or are we actually somewhere here that where we can form a major deposit that cluster. So this, this slide maybe is a bit too much detail. You got the picture before, but this is Escondida. It just shows you that you have a five kilometer scale here huge uh, reserve resource uh, year 2000 here and it's from a public resource uh, database called Portageo. All these different things are super gene hypogene zones in the Escondida district but a, a major cluster. Uh, we go to uh, a different part of the world to Grasberg and Erzberg. Uh, you only see two <laughs> they look quite small but if you look at the scale here again that's two, five kilometers just the same as the Escondida area. Uh, a huge uh, uh, mineral resource uh, at that project, but very focused in two different uh, mines. And if you look at Valiente, uh, this is what we press released in last year in December. I think uh, this needs to be articulated more strongly because in Hanan, we're looking at this cluster. We're seeing uh, the, the area we're looking at to, to drill permit here now, we have one porphyry in Ricardo Riera, we have a second porphyry target in Sortilegio, and we have an epithermal here in Vista Liege that we will be drilling in the next, hopefully in the next two years. Uh, but apart from that, uh, we are seeing a new cluster developing uh, up here in Previsto, uh, where we got uh, uh, some, some interesting press releases in last year, but also uh, we have now the agreement from all the villages there and this area will direct a lot of the news flow from the Valiente project during 2024. Uh, but you, the same picture is being translated. This is a district that is pre-discovery, pre-drilling, but we see the footprint of a major mineral system here. 
scale is the same for all three images here. It's five kilometers, five kilometers, and five kilometers. So I want to talk about the, the drilling in, in, in Belen. Uh, this is a small proportion of, of the Valiente project, uh, but it's all now submitted. We have the social acceptance and, and all that stuff that we discussed in the previous slides. Uh, the DIA will allow us to drill 40 platforms. From one platform, you can drill multiple drill holes, but 40 platforms. Uh, within this polygon here, there's actually two polygons. Within these, these gray polygons here, this guy here, and this bigger polygon here. Within the target area, we have identified three major uh, drill targets, and there, there are some satellites targets uh, that are uh, related to distal parts of these alteration systems you get in intrusions like SCARs. Uh, I will go through them from north to south. Uh, we'll start at Ricardo Herrera, looking at the porphyrit play uh, we have here, uh, the results, why it's a really good target, and de-risked. Uh, then we'll look at, actually we'll go to the north and look at Sordilegio. It has a bit of a different character uh, and a different composition and it looks different, but it's an excellent target with good scale. And finally, we'll look at Vista Alegre. Uh, so, Ricardo Herrera is a, uh, a porphyry uh, that we mapped, uh, well, discovered in 2021, mapped in 2021, 2022. Uh, it's all exposed on the surface, so everything you see is a geological map. Uh, the footprint of the intrusion is about 1,500 meters uh, strike and at kilometers wide. Uh, the core of the intrusion uh, is not really the core, but it's what you call in, in the purpose space the early in st stages of the intrusion. Uh, that's where you have all the, uh, the mineral that is economic. Um, it is about 800 meters long uh, and 200 meters wide, and it's highlighted here in, in the red and the and the other red, <laughs> red number two. Um, in terms of scale, because we're two Swedes sitting here, uh, I put in uh, I take at the same the the, the, at the same uh, uh, what's it called. Uh, yeah, the, the same scale uh, of this image. This is the open pit of Aitik. Aitik is a geochemical anomaly most of the time, but originally it was a bit higher grade. Uh, but now they're mining 0.2% uh, copper or less uh, in in, uh, in that pit. Um, but it's interesting to see that just that this is a significant uh, mineralizing system here, and it's it's a uh, a bullseye porphyry target. When we have collected soils and done all that, it just ticks all the boxes. And of course, it's exposed on the surface as well, so it doesn't take much to, to actually prove it. It's just a drill hole. Um, so uh, the sampling we've done here is in the creeks. Uh, this is a photo of a creek. Unfortunately, I blew it up because it's very blurry. But you can see assistance here being working. This is a Husqvarna rock saw. Uh, so we clear uh, the, the, the vegetation uh, just next to the creek and the outcrops, and then we just cut uh, the rocks with a rock saw like this. We've taken many samples, but it restricts us to, we can only sample where there are rock exposures, and that's generally in the creeks. We cannot go in and clear the jungle to do this work uh, because that's a different permit. So uh, it we really restrict it to where we sample and how we sample it. We don't know if we're sampling the best zones, we're sampling the zones that are exposed. But you can see that many of these samples uh, is, is not what they mine in Aitik, but it's not too far off. Um, we're short channels, two, two meters to seven meters long. We're looking at five or 600 ppm copper to 0.1, uh, 1,400, 1,300 and so forth of copper. But it's important to remember that this is all leached. There's no primary copper mineral. There's no oxide copper mineral. This is sitting in iron oxides. Uh, so the copper, the, the primary mineralization has moved down. Uh, it may have enriched in a super gene blanket. Uh, that could happen in this environment if there's a lot of pyrite. Uh, and it's something we need to see when we start to drilling. Or it has just been dispersed depending on uh, the, the, the uh, groundwater table. But we expect, and that's what I'm trying to say, we expect to see a much higher hypogene mineralization uh, during the drilling. Can I just ask about this? Because I mean, the leaching, so generally speaking, do you have an idea of how deep uh, the leaching uh, kind of takes takes place? In, in, in yes, the... it, it's controlled by the water table. Uh, so if, if you're up on a hill uh, and it's, 
you can think of it as a small hill like this. And if, if it's 200 meters on the top here, and there are creeks on both sides, the water table will be on the creeks and will be a bit higher in the center of the hill as it percolates down. But you can expect that the leaching is taking place for 200 meters, uh, more or less, within that hill. But if you drill down into closer to the to the uh, the creeks, uh, you may only be tens of meters from the interface of the water table. That's that's one aspect. The second is uh, because this is an active area of uplift uh, and the water table, and it's uplift and water table, so there's a balance there. And I think the uplift is faster than the leaching, uh, but it depends on. So it can be very irregular. Excuse me. Uh, so. It, it, it's, it's difficult to predict. It's not a flat desert here. It's, it's a very dynamic environment. So since it's dynamic, I mean, you have, you have higher parts of the topography. Are you seeing any, I mean, are you seeing the same type of uh, mineralization there? Or are you seeing other strands of mineralization at the higher elevation? Or, or is it quite consistent in terms of being kind of a leached uh, now, now we do see on, on the on the top of the hills we do see a stronger leaching and this is a uh, and uh, and this applies also to the summer tin project where we do see a lot of leaching in some of the copper zones there but uh, we don't see the copper but we see that this is the same texture and and the same thing here um, but it's difficult to predict because it's it's an effect of time um, and how long is that outcrop being exposed for leaching or that part being exposed for leaching. But in general, the higher up you go, the more leaching, the longer time it's been sitting there. Um, and when you get cl closer down, uh, it's all, it leaches quite quickly to start with, but then it, there's stronger leaching as well. In, in uh, As you get down to the creeks, you get to see some more primary sulfides uh, and then it's less leaching. Uh, but then it also depends on the whole rock, if it's what type of alteration you see in the whole rock, if it's a lot of uh, Philic alteration, which means micas, um, and philic with mica quartz pyrite in, in the general assemblage. Uh, and then uh, that mica transforms into clays, and that creates a faster leaching. But if you just see a lot of silicification, so quartz alteration, the, the whole stroke will be quite robust and durant because quartz is the last mineral to leach, and that will preserve primary sulfides more. So there are many different factors that affect how strong the leaching is, but all of these channels are leached. There, there are no primary sulfides here. Uh, and, in some creeks, we have seen some chalcosite that is an evidence of of uh, supergene enrichments, and in other creeks, we have native copper, uh, a small flake. So that's also an evidence of that uh, copper movement. Okay, so so um, I guess the the leaching itself leads to the the potential enrichment <clears throat> once you get past the. The, the, the leaching zone, is that correct? Or, or, or does the copper kind of... Uh, yeah, the, le the leaching the does, yes, the leaching is potential enrichment is a part of that. Uh, so it's important for many projects to have that uh, higher grade zone. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it, it's controlled by the water table and uh, hopefully there's a big enrichment zone in, in some of these projects that we see here. Uh, but we haven't mapped it on the surface yet, but we've seen some small snips and evidence. But, We'll see. Okay, I, I, I'll let you get through the geophysics here and I can ask a couple more questions. Yeah, okay. Jumping to uh, the Ricardo Rera target, we did an IP orientation survey here. And if you think about this, this what we call it, looks like more like a, a kidney. Uh, there is a bean-shaped area like this. That's the core. Uh, there are two lines that are highlighted here. Uh, but this is it's an orientation survey of pole dipoles. So we're looking at the chargeability of the rock and we're looking at the resistivity of the rock with this survey and it has a depth capacity of about 500 meters um, so this this line 840 it goes from the sediments to the north and then it goes through the the uh, mineralization uh, and then back out into the wall rock and the same thing here uh, so if we just look at the chargeability in the northern part here that it corresponds to this part of the line uh, we see a chargeability anomaly that is relating to py pyrite in sediments. Uh, as we go here to the south, we're starting to get into this proportion, we start to see a chargeability. Uh, and that corresponds more or less to a, a unit that we call early porphyry one. So that's, that's a porphyry target uh, that is chargeable here uh, that we've seen on the surface. Uh, and as we get to the southern part, the central uh, and down here, we start to see again, a conductive uh, chargeable unit uh, that is also showing a strong 
depth continuity here. So this, this zone seems to be plunging to the south here. Um, there are two different, very technical now, but there are two different uh, early stage porphyries here. And those two porphyries are both strongly mineralized. The early one and early two, there were hot events of this intrusion that they got in. And we've, we've separated them with, with mapping, but also with geochronology, where we have dated and radi radiometric dating of circles in these two rocks. But they're important because it tells us that this early porphyry one is an isolated event. Not It's good on the surface, but it doesn't extend beyond two, 300 meters depth in this image. But the early porphyry two does look good on the surface, but it does extend to the depth. So that's where you want to drill underneath that as well, of course. If you go to the next line, this is 200 meters uh, to the east. Uh, the same history here. The early porphyry one is less, but you can look at the early porphyry two. It looks even better now as you go here. Um, and if you go and look at the resistivity, uh, the resistivity in porphyry deposits are usually uh, high where you have the sulfides because they are not connected. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. We see high resistivities. In, in relation to the uh, high charge abilities. Uh, and the same thing here. If you go to a BMS target, you will be looking at a very high conductivities, uh, high res uh, low resistivities, and it will be looking like this. But this color here is this high. Just quickly showing this line 920, it's my favorite in this image. This is far away from the surface exposure. We're almost uh, from this line here, we're looking, we've been jumping 600 meters to the east. Uh, and we're going to look at the, what happens with the early porphyry two to the south here. Does it plunge to the south from the surface? Does it plunge down like this? And when you look at the IP, there's nothing here uh, on the surface, but when you get down to depth in this southern part of the line, you can see, wow, that's an awesome target. And you can see the resistivity is really high. So this is a bullseye target uh, just sitting here on, the, on, this, on this line here. So this is an excellent example of how you can de-risk the, the geology on the recovery area, both by mapping and then doing an IP survey like this and saying, well, it doesn't uh, look pretty good, both on, in, in 2D and 3D, put it that way. So so one thing yep. that I would like to ask is just, if you have two different porphyries, I guess, to my understanding, and one one is is um, porphyry one, as you call it, is, is, is uh, kind of close to surface, much of it seems to have been probably eroded away over time. Is that a fair interpretation? No, no, actually, it's it's you can think of porphyry camps or intrusion uh, as as different pulses of magma going up the same conduit. The early stage of this this conduit will be hotter in, in terms of temperature, not in terms of uh, in temperature, and it will co contain more uh, metal. It will have all the, uh, and it will create a higher temperature minerals. It will be more copper. It will have the potassium core and everything like that. And then subsequently, you will have a different pulse coming up. And, it, and that's usually generalized called as intermineral stage of porphyry. And that will be more, uh, uh, more weakly mineralized, uh, maybe 0.1, 0.2% copper. Uh, and the, uh, there's less potassium alteration in that, whereas the, the, the core, you'll be looking at 0.5 to 1% copper, uh, which hopefully is in gold credits. And then at the final stage, when the, 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 the magma is starting to cool down, you go into the late, and it's called late, uh, late stage intrusion. Uh, and then you, maybe you get some pyrite, uh, but uh, you don't get any copper. And then subsequent to that, you get more intrusions. Like you see here, there's a satellite intrusion. They're also very late. And this guy here is late. So they're unmineralized intrusions. They're min unmineralized and unaltered. Uh, and this, this what happened here is that we had an early porphyry one that was 11, no, let's see, this 15.6 million years old that popped up. And that was subsequently reactivated. And the, the, there was another pulse at 15.4, so 200,000 years later in the dating, the second intrusion came in that was equally hot. So it was reactivated with another hot pulse. And sometimes that happens. So that's very positive when you see that happening. So they're actually a part of the same system. It doesn't mean that this has been eroded. It actually may have been eaten up because this is a mega class in the other one now. So it's it's an extremely dynamic environment uh, in terms of that. And if you're unlucky in a porphyry camp, you can have some great evidence of mineralization, but the intermineral is very big and it actually destroys the early mineral phase of the intrusion. So 
there's no porphyry left uh, that, that to, to mine because it was destroyed by subsequent pulses of the magma. I mean, it's obvious you have a porphyry. That, that's, there's no doubt about that. The scale potential is there. You can see that too. But what evidences do you see as to the quality of it? Because all the minerals at surface, you can, you're just inferring. It looks quite strong, although it's been leached. So is there a way to methodologic, like, like to infer that, okay, it's looking like this when it's leached, that we can assume that it's going to be, you know, four, five, six times the, I don't know. I mean, it, is yeah. that possible to do? I, 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 when you have a drill hole, you can start doing that. Uh... Okay. Uh, and when you look at IP data like this, this theoretical data, if you have mass, if you have chalcopyrite, it should have a theoretical IP response with a certain value. But because we're looking at uh, natural systems here, they are not they are not clean. They are a mix of different signatures, and and, and uh, it doesn't work like that in nature. So they can be very different. But I think it's reasonable to think that you're looking at uh, four to five times uh, higher grade in the uh, hypogene zone, so in the primary zone of the sulfides, compared to the leach zone. That's what I apply, but I, I don't have any hard evidence that it is like that, but that's what I would think. But at this point, I mean, you've done essentially all the work to, uh, would you say you've done all the work to even play, I mean, place exactly where you're going to drill the first hole, the second hole, all of that is done, so it's drilled ready completely at this point. Yes, I'd say that. Uh, we will do an, a more detailed as we get approval of the data, we will do a more detailed IP survey over this this entire trend here and including this uh, target here. But uh, basically, it's drill ready, Gorm. Uh, uh, it's 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 just as de risked as you want to in exploration. Uh, yeah, but that's all that needs to be said then, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have to wait for the permits and then uh, we'll see. Yeah. So the permit here, you can just, it's a quick slide. But this is the uh, the zone uh, targets like this testing on the depth continuity of the plunge uh, and then we have 16 platforms 25 drill holes on this slide about 10,000 meters of drilling testing it to a 500 meter vertical depth uh, is reasonable to start with but you know if there's mineral in the hole there's we will continue drill to a thousand meters uh, if, if we're in the zone so so at Valiente uh, we also have uh, the Sortilejo target. Uh, so this is again, a part of the, the area that we have submitted a drill application to now uh, in, in Belen, we call it the Belen zone. Compared to Ricardo Herrera that we just went through, this is a, a very different porphyry in terms of its surface expression. It's uh, an area where we have multi-stage intrusions, intrusions uh, that are about 21 to 22 million years old. And they have very strange composition and textures, and they are being overprinted by a, a network, veinlets of goethite, hematite, so iron oxides that are strongly anomalous in copper. We believe that these iron oxides have formed after primary copper minerals. I'll show you uh, some of the photos of the rocks. But what's interesting with this style is that it actually doesn't sit in this typical porphyry setting. It's 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 but it forms. Uh, consistent uh, and coherent areas of, of veinlets. So this, this red polygon here would be uh, an area where you have more than 20 veinlets per meters that are copper mineralized. Uh, and it's about 300 by 350 meters, uh, uh, an area like this. And in the halo here, you'd be looking at less than 20 uh, veinlets per meter. So it's an appealing exploration target, um, that is, but it's, it's not your typical for free uh, that we just went through in Ricardo, so it has a very different footprint. Uh, the scale of this target is 1.8 kilometers by the strike, and it has this high-grade pulse here. If you look at it, uh, we've taken a lot of channel samples in the creeks, we've mapped it, we have uh, taken a soil survey here, uh, and it just comp if you compare this donut here with this circle in the middle, I'll just go back to the previous slide, this is exactly the same thing you see here, right? Uh, that expression is, is also in the soil. So the soils are very local targets. Even this little kidney out here is replicated in the soils there. Uh, lots of channel samples uh, identified six higher grade zones with more than 20 veinlets. Uh, we have an average of 2.54 me meters at close to 800 ppm copper locally up to 0.4%, 0.44% copper. 
uh, in, in some of the channels that we've taken here. And uh, we have breccia textures, uh, we have these veinlets that are mineralized, overprinting different types of whole sprocks, just this and this. So uh, if you're looking at a global uh, analog to this, you will be going to the British Columbia uh, in, in, uh, in North America, uh, where you have alkali porphyries that have overprinting the same type of whole sprocks with a network of, of, of sulfides in these fissures we will see sulfides as this being drilled down to depth but this is the surface expression so um, uh, i think it's an appealing exploratory due to scale and the potential to find uh, more high-grade zones within this area one thing that is really remarkable here that we found some boulders that have 16 percent copper and four grams of gold and and what's known with these alkali targets is that they are magmatic breccias where you have very um, so magmatic sulfide breccias is where you have most massive sulfides are, are not common but there's an important part to make them economic and they are uh, an appealing part of the exploration store here we've seen the boulders but we haven't seen the outcrops yet so uh, we had never covered this with an ip survey a pole dipole like ricardo Riera, but we will before drilling and that will help us identify geophysical targets in this big trend here uh, the drilling uh, is scheduled here. You can see we have platforms planned uh, in most spots uh, and we'll be able to drill from these platforms, uh, uh, these higher grade zones. Uh, and if we get any good IP anomalies in that survey, we can change the direction of the drill hole to go in a different orientation. So uh, target that as well. It's really interesting though, we have a big fault uh, to the west here and, and this is a limestone and you know that scarms are an important part of the porphyry store as well, it's a different it's a part of the same intrusion related uh, mineral system. Uh, and we have some very good zinc and lead anomalies here and potentially uh, if we have no good anomalies we'll also plant some drill holes to be able to test that uh, in the limestones. Okay. Then I'm jumping to Vista Alegre. Uh, and this is nice to be showing a gold slide in a gold market like this, but uh, we, we're uh, uh, we, we're we're looking again. If if you go through the idea of a porphyry target, you have porphyries and distal to the porphyries, you get epithermal. So this all relates to the same mineral systems. It's a part of the same mineralizing event. Uh, so it's 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 common to find these things in porphyry camps. This is located three kilometers south of Sotelejo and uh, three kilometers north of Ricardo Rea, so just in between, along a major uh, sub-Andean fault. Uh, there's a lot of informal mining uh, in this area where they, they do panning, uh, oh, oh, sorry, panning of the soils. And here you can see uh, one of their uh, uh, channels where they try to, to uh, get the soils to uh, to clean up for the gold as they will travels down this is an as a bamboo rod uh, that they're using uh, and here's a pan of results they've been very successful in this instance here lots of gold in that pan uh when we came in here we immediately discovered big big boulders they are from uh, being the type uh, size of your desk to the size of your car uh of uh, of massive quartz and, and they're very robust and rigor, rigid. And as I said earlier, quartz is the most uh, durable material in this environment because it doesn't weather very quickly. And when we break them up, we have fresh sulfides. And when we have a look at them, there's pyrite and chalcopyrite. They go from point to half, a, half a gram of gold to 3.2 grams of gold. Uh, but they are preserved over a long strike. We're looking at a boulder train that is 1.7 kilometers long. But and when we take soil samples, we have identified a three kilometer trend uh, made up of two different parallel trends. So in the combined strike is three kilometers. It's open to the north as well, the same trend. We believe this is a high sulfidation at thermal target, but we don't have a lot of boulders to base that on. So it could also be an intermediate sulfidation target, but it's in that spectra. Uh, and uh, uh, the area is relatively flat, so it's difficult to, to do any channel sampling there, but we've, we've dug holes and we've taken lots of soil samples. And this slide here, you see some examples of, of the gold trend. These are soil samples, uh, and gold, so white and, and red and, and magenta here is very high. The scale here is unfortunately truncated, but this is uh, basically, this trend is, there's one trend here and one trend here. Uh, and the, the grades you're looking at in the soils go over 0.1 gram uh, in the soils. And that's where the guys are panning those creeks. 
The big boulders that we're finding uh, are located in this creek here, but there are also some here. So it's natural to think that they are actually related to this soil anomaly here, and they've just been rolling down this, this hill here. They look like this, uh, milky quartz, lots of pyrite, uh, and within the pyrite, uh, some chalcum pyrite. And this is what's uh, preserved, and the, the rusty parts are the leached parts here, but that's point almost three grams in that uh, boulder, and a quite fair bit of copper as well. Uh, less copper in this guy, but uh, still a fair bit of gold. Uh, if we still look at the, the Vista Lega target, the geology that we've developed in this area is based out of uh, hand dug holes to see what kind of rock ships we find out. But in the pur purple here, we have uh, an early uh, intrusion uh, that we can say is a Plutonic rock. It's a technical term. It means that it's a, it's 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 not a porphyry. It's like a granite. This is a granite diorite. But it's 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 a different type of rock. Uh, that contact uh, to the sediments here in yellow uh, is is structural, uh, and this is what's controlling uh, the gold boulders we're seeing in that target. Uh, in in this rock, the purple rock here, we actually see alteration in strongly leached veinlets uh, of iron oxides today, but they have a lot of gold and also some copper in them like this here. Uh, so they're, they're quite interesting. We don't, yeah, uh, we don't know, we haven't been able to put them into a model yet, but they are related to this gold story we see here. Along this trend, we also see some highly unusual intrusive bodies uh, like this, there's a massive magnetite body here. Usually when you say massive magnetite, people start to think ISOG or SCARM. Uh, but again, this tells a story about the composition of the host magmas here. These systems that we're looking at, the Sortilegio, they are very alkalic and having mag uh, magnetite intrusion and magnetite dikes in an alkalic system is actually quite common. And we have global examples of that in, in BC. We've done some orientation studies here. Uh, we've been able to look, this is the uh, chargeability and this is the resistivity uh, and as we look at this this slide here we're, we're seeing that okay we have a chargeable anomaly uh, in the sediments on this slide we're mapping something here between a big break between the high and the low or lower and that's the fault you see here uh, and then we have a chargeable anomaly here somewhere that is unexplained we don't know what that is doing that chargeable anomaly is also related to a very strongly uh, strong uh, resistivity zone you see here. So if, if, you're, if you're applying the same logic we did in Ricardo Rera, this has this geophysical signature of a porphyry target at depth here. Uh, so we need to do more geophysics here. We need to do more IP as the DS approved. We will do more IP and, and see if that's a valid drill target. But that, that is really interesting to see that sitting there concealed. Uh, in the granite diorite. And it's impossible to have a granite diorite that is 20 million years old and then 5 million years later, you will have one of these Ricardo Rera type intrusions into that diorite in a structural setting here. So that's that's all in this, it's all very plausible in this environment. So I think, uh, yeah, on the surface, we're looking at the summarize all these three targets. We're just looking at two, two porphyry targets and one epithermal targets, but you can see that once we get more IP in, uh, that will also generate uh, deeper targets within that this program. Here's the drilling, the platforms that we're targeting, uh, that IP and all that's mentioned out here, uh, SCARM uh, being targeted on this vault and the epithermal here. I'd like to go back to just show an image of the project because we're just, we're just it's like a, a string of pearls at the moment, the great projects we're lighting up here. So just to put it in context, I don't have that map uh, in the presentation, unfortunately, but We've gone through the western part of Aliente. We looked at three great targets uh, that we developed that is going through uh, permitting now for drilling. Uh, we're going to step into what we're working on at this time in Hanan in 2024. And this 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 uh, was an early discovery in the project, but it's been pending social access to go there. Um, this project area will generate a lot of the news from, from uh, Valiente uh, in this year. So I dug up this press release on our website that is from January 2021. Uh, and I thought, I wonder how this stacks up today, what, what we're actually doing here. But uh, it's interesting. We had permit uh, to do some, some basic work, uh, but then uh, we lost that permit because of, of the political whims in Peru. 
uh, but we regained the permit now last year in, in uh, yeah, starting in October. Uh, we've been working in this area now, and now we will we have agreements from all four villages uh, in this very big area. This is about 15 kilometers north to south and eight or eight kilometers wide. Originally, we took a lot of samples here and we identified a big gold anomaly, big copper anomaly. We found all these red triangles, great boulders, great styles, uh, and we thought this this is a great great target. We want to do more work here. Unfortunately. Uh, we had to wait for two years. So, yeah, going from this slide, uh, this is what we discovered in, in, in December, uh, no, sorry, in, in January uh, 2021. Uh, so great context with all those catchments from rivers, big target, the gold and copper. Uh, and uh, when we started fieldwork last year, we, we focused in on an area that is uh, located west uh, east of this river here. Um, we started to take a lot of soil samples and we press released this in December. Uh, but it's uh, an incredible target scale. Uh, we're looking at gold results here now and, and uh, uh, in, in red dots we're looking at everything from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 grams of gold in the soils here and it extends over one kilometer of strike and uh, a few hundred meters of width. In the same area we're finding boulders uh, that are mineralized of different styles of breccias and everything. And it, it just has all the right uh, ingredients uh, to be uh, an excellent exploration target. Um, but there are no surface exposures, no outcrops or anything in this area, like the Caldo Herrera. Uh, but I think it's important just to see that this, 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 that's the first target we've actually developed from this zone here. And it's located just, just outside these catchments, it's just on the side here now. Subsequently, the work that our team is doing now is focusing on this area here now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can't go into the details, but as I said, we're making new discoveries every month. Yes, so, so why uh, is this so important, the first discovery we're making here, and, and uh, uh, what makes this different from Ricardo Herrera? Uh, if we go, then we have to step back a bit, because we're looking at intrusive rocks into sediments, uh, but when we start to look at the composition of these rocks, we're seeing that they have a very, very different composition to uh, the Belen zone that we went through earlier. Um, the composition is what we called alkalic, and these rocks are extremely alkalic, uh, and they're quite unusual targets uh, in, in the porphyry space, but they form very gold-rich deposits. And that's why I think we see that great anomaly in, in uh, Previsto East, where we have one kilometer long soil trend of gold. Um, and there's a lot of other trace pathfinders there as well. And I'm highlighting this hand sample here now with some green minerals. And that's a uh, vanadium mineral called uh, roscolite. Uh, and if we look at the composition of the rock samples we see in Previsto in this very technical diagram, we, we're looking at something that is going from Belen, Ricardo Herrera, uh, becoming a bit more alkaline, but it plots very different here. And this just tells us how to explore for this target and what we can expect to find. Uh, so the, the, the price here, if we're just breaking it down, is a gold-rich porphyry uh, of hopefully a significant scale. Uh, the target I'm highlighting here is located here. Uh, this is uh, the focus of the exploration work now. You can see it's another magnetic anomaly and also this area here. Uh, just this is from USGS. So why why are gold rich porphyries and epithermals in alkaline systems important? This is just covering alkaline systems, but there's some nice names in this this context here. We're looking at uh, Ladolam in in Papua New Guinea, uh, Porgera in Papua New Guinea. There is uh, uh, yeah a few others as well that falls into that alkaline. Uh, uh, or free epithermal spectrum. And what's important is the pathfinder elements uh, that you're looking at here are the same as we're finding in uh, Previsto, uh, and some of the textures and the minerals are the same as well. So it's it's technically a very de-risked interpretation of the expression model here. Yeah, so, so I, I guess what I would like to ask, your rough estimation, it's difficult to predict in Peru, but when does the Belen targets get drilled approximately? What's the range of outcomes? And when does Previsto potentially get drilled? Because it's all about that, you know, verifying these targets. And if you hit one strong, people are going to start assuming that the other ones might be strong as well. 
Okay, well, it, let's let's just base it on the time it took for us to permit uh, the San Martin project, uh, where we received the permit in, in January. That took uh, just about two years, a bit less, uh, but uh, 20 to 22 months uh, in San Martin. Uh, so if we apply the same permitting time for Valiente, we would receive the permit uh, in two years from, from January. Uh, then when you get the permit, you need to apply for a few other steps. Uh, it's initiated activities and the water permit. The water permit now comes with initiated activities, but that is also 45 days of automatic approval. Uh, and then when you get the, uh, that, you, you can start preparing the platform. So once you get the DE approved, it takes two, three more months to get the drill rig on site. Right, so that will so, be... So let's say two years, two years. And if it happens faster, uh, I'm, I'm uh, the happiest person on the planet. But uh, that's what I expect based on what we saw in San Martin. But, but San Martin, I mean, generally in Peru, uh, I mean, it, it is two years, the rule, or is that a bit of an anomaly is to give people a sense? Because that's a very long time to get permitted for drill. <laughs> I don't want to give any false promises, Gorm. Uh, no. There are examples of Peru that have been faster. There are examples that have uh, been slower. Okay, I mean, it, have you identified any things that you that, that you allows you to speed up from the experience with San Martin here with your permitting team, or uh, is there any reason to believe that it might be faster, or are you just gonna? The only reason say? it could be faster is we've done it once now, right? And. We, as we go on, we'll do things, we, we're learning by doing. And uh, uh, from that aspect, it could be faster. We've done it once. We know what we need to improve from the previous application. And, and we won't uh, make, uh, you know, make the same mistakes. There were no mistakes, but we need to make the same clarifications. That's one thing. The Peruvian government is uh, strongly promoting and trying to improve the, the permitting time in Peru. So that's also something that could make it faster um, if, if they're successful. Um, so absolutely, there are things that are positive. Uh, but again, uh, I don't want your investors to, to say, hey, this large guy you said it will take, they will do it in one year. Uh, <laughs> they can blame it on me. It's, it's I who I'm trying to push a little bit. But, yes. but, but, but then, is there potential? My ideas are quite. I mean, you 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 permit for a bunch of drilling here. I mean, that's like uh, it's not. You're not going to get that done in half a year. It's going to take more time to drill thirty thousand yes. meters. There are different permits in Peru, and we're looking into. Uh, this is a one percent chance that this could work, uh, but we're looking into making a simpler permit in Valiente for uh, for this this target that I'm, I showed you here. If that works. Uh, If that works, we could be drilling in, in uh, six months time uh, in, in, in uh, at this target, six to eight months time, but we will be drilling it this year. Uh, uh, but it's it's a permit that is filled with restrictions. So we won't be able to drill the, the, the areas that looks best on the surface, but we will be able to mobilize a drill rig and put a hole here uh, and see where it takes us. Uh, but because we're going through the process of understanding, we need we have had a biologist in the field collecting baseline data here just to see if if because this this is jungle in in the public documents, but in real life it's actually deforested. Uh, so what parts of this deforested zone are more open uh, to put a hand portable low impact drill rig in that we can get approved or not? That's what we're investigating now. So the reality is. Even though we say it takes two years, Hannon is not sitting here saying, oh, it takes two years and we're rolling our thumbs. We are working very hard. Our entire team is working very hard to get a drill rig on site as soon as possible here. So we're doing everything in our power, I should put that clear as well, to make this go faster. But yeah. uh, the reality is uh, we're a formal company. We don't take any shortcuts. We follow the laws in Peru. And uh, uh, we're, it, there are things that are outside our control uh if yep. it takes two years or six months but you know you understand the the, the chances now i think the different uh, permits okay uh and i guess we should I, I should kind of ask you i mean lars will, will have gone through all the details of valiente but this is kind of the 
it, uh, to my understanding, it's, it's the crown you or this is the massive, this is the, the decade project to unlock a new district of multiple uh, porphyries that you've identified. If one is strong, likely some of the other ones will be strong as well. You could see multiple billions of tons. I mean, if, if it proves out in terms of grace, it could be a, a massive, ma it's a massive idea, right? Um, what yeah. would be your kind of personal view? Because it's, 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 it's a bit out of the way. It's in the jungle. There are obviously some issues. You would have to get it in you know, ma massive infrastructure to build mines there. So what would you say is, okay, this is good enough to attract someone to, to say, okay, we're going to take on this, this massive effort to build out a new mining district in Peru. Comes down to, to grade and scale, doesn't it? Again, on every every project, so you it, it it will come down to the local area where we are. You know, we are a long way from shipping concentrate. There are roads to to Lima, but uh, you're probably four hours further than the closest mine. So you got to you got to have the weather all to to track it that little bit further. Uh, you probably the, the other option is to go the other way down the river system out the other way, but I, I don't think that's environmentally the the way that I see it. But that's a big question for another day, not for for me today. But um, you know, I, I, I'll answer it sort of differently. I I I, I see that uh, Southern Cross is an amazing discovery, best gold discovery in the world today, in my view, in many respects, and the data shows that. Uh, and and it will make people a lot a lot of money if it continues if it continues the way that it has been continuing right and, and that's what the beauty of drilling shows us will or will show us uh, I, I see Hannon as the the greater discovery in many respects because this is a new belt <laughs> this is multiple deposits um, and so uh, yeah it's 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 different it's got those challenges. Um, but it comes down to grade. I, I put I put point seven uh, there, but if it's point three in the jungles and you got to truck it up to you know the top of the Andes and down the other side, that's not going to work. But it's, if it's one percent, uh, there's not many one percent porphyries. Um, it's got a great gold credit. That is a you know I talked about the gold companies going after these things now, and that adds a lot of value. Um, and 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 you can you can do a lot of different things with a very healthy gold credit. So, um, and these these are gold rich porphyries, um, which are a little bit unique also. So, it 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 will come down to the grade and the exact location and around rivers and and uh, access to existing infrastructure, which is you know which is quite. You know, we 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 drive in and out of a town called Tingo Maria to. 40 minutes to most of these projects in Valiente, right? They're, they're, they're actually, um, you know, got, got infrastructure around them and power and all those kind of things. So we don't have to worry about those. It's, it's more so, you know, a lot of rain. Um, so engineering, tailing stamps and those kind of things will take a lot of money uh, to, to make sure that, um, to make sure that that's done all appropriately. So they're, they're the big questions that, you know, before a drill hole, um, but uh, you you can't answer. But they're the kind of things you know. We're not looking for marginal mineralization out there. We're looking for big systems, and and they've got to have the grade. Uh, and I mean, I mean, Valiente, uh, it, it, it's the capital question, right? To unlocking this district, it's uh, the idea is here. If you have success with the other projects before you get into sort of uh, later age one twenty five, when you might be able to start drilling at the balance zone. Um, how do you envision sourcing the capital to be able to get that going? I mean, it, it's a district. So you have, do you want to keep everything 100% or are you considering optioning off a portion of it to, to maybe a strategic investment and your JV up on one and then you get, maybe get an injection of cash? What, how, what's the puzzle you're solving for here, you think? Well, why we're such a low cost company and we're de-risking it ourselves from the social side of things and getting those drill permits um, and we've got the ability to pick the best targets ourselves as we're sort of filtering through all that um, we're, we're happy to do what we're doing at the moment but you can see clearly uh, in in years to come how do you drill 18 porphyries <laughs> as a small company right it's it's tough uh, and it's time and it's better to share the experience um, and and no doubt bringing in partners on various parts of that system, I think makes sense. 
not not necessarily today as where where we're just going through the filtering and the initials but if again if uh you know we can drill when we drill balen or when we get to drill previsto and uh and we can demonstrate highly economic systems in this cluster concept then that will make these projects more valuable so there's also the other reason of doing a deal when we've demonstrated the concept and it's not costing us a a lot of of capital at the moment for such a big win and you know there's you know you can have a look at solaris or or sol gold or any of these companies that are they they're on you know they're what they've got porphyry centers but you know they've they've got uh much less in terms of you know the number of porphyries that we're talking about but they've got very good projects if we can get to any one of those on any one of one or more of our our systems you know there's a billion dollar company hidden in each one of you know these these porphyry clusters that we have so we've got multiple options of building that billion dollar company out of this this company big swing <laughs> got to do a lot of the a lot of the work still to get there, but we're getting down that path, right? We're getting those permits. We're getting those those uh, those geological indications um, that uh, make us very excited. Every time we go and walk onto these projects, we get more and more excited. So I, I guess that the first swing um, at the Belen zone, which will happen sometime next year, fingers crossed. I mean, it should if, if uh, should. should people yep. get it permitted. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is like a uh, how much would you want to drill up front first what do you think would it be a 5k could you stretch all the way up to 10k or what, what do you think is the idea sufficient idea yeah well you've got to test you're racing ahead of that and then you can verify something then you can race probably more effectively so what's the initial scope you think to prove prove the concept well again i'm going to annoy you and answer it the other way because it's all about the cost of capital yeah so, it is yeah, so we're not going to go and put 10 kilometers in if we've got a market cap that doesn't justify that. But, you know, I, I'd say there'd be a hell of a lot of lot of excitement at that point, um, you know, market dependent. And, you know, look, copper's ripping again. Everyone's worked out that we're short of copper again all of a sudden. And who, who would have thunk? Um, but it, uh, it needs... It needs a minimum of ten kilometers because we've got two porphyry scans and an epithermal system. So, but again, it's probably iterative, and um, and and you you really focus in on your best targets. And you know, the Sortilecchio um, uh, looks very interesting because that's an alkaline system. It's got the gold, um, but we've done a lot of the work on Ricardo Herrera. We're not doing a lot more of the work until those permits come. So the IP. You know, we're not going to go and put IP, which is basically defining drill targets. Um, we did it, did it at Ricardo Herrera to prove the concept and it worked very well. Like I said, we know we've got a massive anomaly beneath the copper we're mapping at surface, but it's no use for us to wait uh, to go and do the IP today and spend shareholder funds while we're waiting for those permits. We can do that as 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 they come um, and uh, and then we'll target the drilling so we don't have a drill plan at the moment but um yeah to answer your question it's a minimum 10 kilometers just for that system alone this this is uh, a great discovery uh, again it's it's hard to believe someone is always saying it. it's always great discoveries but this is again a true discovery uh in in peru of a target style that was they were it was known to exist in the sub andean but it was never properly explored uh, the, the style of mineralization is sediment hosted copper. It forms very high grade copper deposits that are quite big. It accounts for about 20% of the world's copper output. Uh, most well known targets or mines are in Poland, Germany, in the Cooper Schiffer, uh, and in the Central African uh, Republic, uh, in the Central African Copper Belt. Yeah, there are many different copper uh, deposits uh, of this style. And there's some in Russia, uh, in the US. Uh, so it's, it's a very appealing exploration target. We have a very big land position in San Martin uh, that covers 650 square kilometers. Uh, and it's a basin place. So uh, when I say basin, I mean uh, a hole on earth where sediments that have accumulated. 
this hole on Earth is about the size of Ireland. So it, it's a big basin uh, where, where we have these ore forming processes that could uh, 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 that we are exploring. Uh, the project is fully funded, and here I noticed something that says 55% should be 85. I don't know why it says 85. It should be 85% by spending 35 million US uh, by Jogmec. Uh, and that's divided in, into different steps. Uh, uh, so the project is it's not diluting our shareholders at the moment and it's fully funded uh for the coming financial year and, and now with the drilling uh the drilling is also funded right so i made that point here uh we're hoping to start the drilling here in may june i will push it back to june late june perhaps now uh but uh it's it's happening and we're going through the the, the uh, all the logistical exercise with the contractors and and uh, have all the agreements in place with the villages and we're now waiting for the approval to initiate activities once we get that we can start to do the drill platforms and the target we're drilling is this this uh, red square here called tabalosos east uh this is yeah I, this is me again <laughs> just looking stepping back saying why why is this important for your investors why is this important for geologists why do we need context when we explore so that's this just me again but Stepping back, looking at big picture uh, is what I love to do. And this project has a lot of big picture uh, ingredients that makes it interesting to explore. Uh, we know that sedimentosity copper deposits, they form giant deposits, as I mentioned, Sextan Basin in Poland, the Central African Copper Belt, Udakan. Uh, so they're appealing exploration targets. The problem is that you can have any bucket of sand and you can produce sedimentosity copper deposits. So how do you find the big ones? Uh, we know that the central uh, in central so it's not central um, in in the in uh, South America uh, we have copper uh, mineralization in rift basins that extends from the central uh, uh, Central America up in the north to uh, the most southern part of, of uh, Chile and Argentina in the south. They are mapped here by spikings in 2016, uh, and in each of these areas we start to see. Uh, sediment holes the copper placed uh, they are not export or they are export partially uh, but there's uh, uh, I think there's a positive steal of this style of uh, target style in South America because it's so it's a bit remote if you put it that way uh, and uh, it also uh, is in competition with porphyry and epithermals in that spectrum but in the last 20 years, we've seen massive infrastructure development in the South Andean zone, as I mentioned here, San Martin is a, a typical sample here, and uh, uh, Valiente as well. So it's opening up this new search base as, as people start to uh, uh, develop new parts of South America. Uh, 700, 7,000 kilometer belt with different porphyry styles. Uh, no, sorry, uh, sedimentals of copper uh, targets. Uh, so in my view, uh, there needs to be a big deposit here somewhere. So how do we find it? Which part of these small basins is the most, is the best? Uh, and, and what ingredients are we looking for to find the best basin? That's what we're asking ourselves. The San Martin project is located in a basin called the Wayaga Basin. Uh, this basin has undergone the same type of deformation you see in the Central African Copper Belt. It has all the key ingredients to develop big deposits. It has regional red beds uh, that are good as a, uh, as a source for the metals. Uh, it has very extensive redox boundaries in the, in the stratigraphy that creates good traps for these metals when they, when they, when they move up in, during deformation. So we actually get uh, somewhere to form the deposits. And we have a lot of salt accumulations, both in the Central African, but also in the Wayaga. Wayaga Basin is probably uh, this, the, the basin in Peru that has most salt accumulations. Uh, and you also see active petroleum systems, both in the Wayaga and the Central African Congo. So these factors makes the Wayaga a very interesting exploration play uh, from a big picture. So the stuff we discovered, this is a summary slide to, to show uh, a lot of technical uh, work uh, and thinking that's gone into this project. But the stuff we discover are excellent. Um, we start here on the right hand side with uh, uh, Tabalosos. 
uh, in Jera and Isla Cancha South, but also in Solitor, we start to see a one to two meter wide uh, shale that is developing over the vast areas. We can only see it where it's exposed on the surface. It's, it continues under these green rocks, or yellow rocks, uh, back into these green rocks and so forth, but it's, we can only explore it where it's exposed, of course. Um, but highlighting some of the results in these channels here, this is a rock face in a landslide, uh, and uh, it's 1.4 meters at 14.5% copper and 272 grams per silver in this channel here. Uh, going a few meters to the uh, downhill, uh, or down this, this the mineralized level here, we have 3.4 meters at 1.6 copper and 26 grams silver. Uh, and going to the next channel, we have similar grades, uh, silver and so forth back here. And, and this is what we're drilling now in the upcoming campaign. This has never been drilled before. Uh, we have taken over 100 channel samples uh, over a nine kilometer long trend here. It averaged 0.9 meters in thickness on the surface with 1.9% copper and an ounce of silver more or less uh, in this zone. So seeing the continuity with the drilling will be very interesting here. Uh, and and if, if we can map this uh, over a a nine kilometer long trend by 800 meters width, you can do the back of the envelope yourself and see how many tons uh, that builds up uh, with these grades of copper. Uh, the thickness we're mapping uh, with on the surface is comparable to what they're mining in, 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 in the Cooper Shipper in Poland. So it all falls into that uh, spectra. Uh, that is no very good target. Uh, the style of mineralization is very chalcosite rich. Chalcosite is a great um, copper mineral um, and it's very appreciated by uh, the metallurgists. Second to this style here, we are making a new discovery in, in Solitor. This is a, a very different exploration target, but also again very attractive. It's in, in, in shape, it's more similar to a porphyry because it develops large tonnage, but high grade target in sediments. They are very structurally controlled. Uh, this is a sandstone and the black here is secondary copper oxide and the green here is a more well-recognized secondary copper oxide uh, in a leached sandstone. So this is, there's no primary sulfides left here. Originally, there are probably been chalcosite, ornite, chalcopyrite in this sample here and it must have been much more high grade. This is about 1% copper today. But uh, yeah, I, I'm i hoping that we can t take that times five uh, uh, when we do the drilling there in the future. Unfortunately, this is, was discovered very recently and we don't have any uh, drill application here yet, but this is pipeline this year to start the DIA process here in Solitor. If you go back into the Tabalosis area, just looking at the drill program uh, that will start in June, uh, it looks like this. You have a, roughly a nine kilometer trend, uh, different sediments in different colors here, uh, and the mineralized horizon that we mapped on the surface is in this red line, and where we have inferred it with soil samples is dashed. Uh, these blue SM are platforms. We're targeting the western flank of this project. Why? Because of the uh, the gently dipping to almost flat geometry of the mineralization, as you can see here. Uh, as we go to the eastern flank, it becomes very steep and it's less uh, less economical if you put in put it into a, a, a mining economic perspective. So it's better to target this this flat lying uh, proportion of the the mineralization. This section here is the most northern one here, and you can see the platforms that we're planning to drill. Uh, the shallow drill holes, 100, 250, and 400 meters. And it's probably, this is a 500 meter width of the mineralization here. So going from here, we'll look at this section here. Uh, Again, this is about 800 meter width of the middle station, and this is a 600 meter deep drill hole here to target that. Uh, that's that section here. Everywhere on the surface, we know we have channel sampled it here, we have channel sampled it here. Going to section eight, located here, uh, we have interpreted some more structural interference, more steeply dips here. Uh, 
but again, we see an opportunity to, to drill it far back here and, and test the mineralization in another position here. So you can get the idea that this, this continuous subsurface for kilometers like this, this is a two kilometer spacing uh, between that hole and that hole. Uh, and finally, uh, this is a conceptual section down here. I don't think we will drill this. It's a quite deep hole. It's a thousand meters, uh, but it highlights uh, the, uh, the continuity of the mineralization here and uh, more structural interference in this zone here. So even though it looks near surface, it may not be the best targets uh, for an up, uh, the initial stage of the program. However, as we progress, uh, the deeper targets could be better. Do you have any Thoughts about this summit in drilling, Gorm? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so, so so the width is in line with what is considered, you know, high quality and economic, probably uh, when you compare to Cooper Schiffer. But th the question is, I guess, uh, from a mining perspective, is the the overburden, the structural integrity of the the rocks above where you will tunnel in and mine this. Do you have a sense of that yet, or do you will you have to drill to to get, gain confidence? <sighs> Uh, yes, the, the weathering uh, uh, and the, the structural deformation in a trust and fall build like this needs to be accounted for. As you can see here on, on some of these slides, uh, I believe that these are relatively underformed proportions uh, of this project area. The main deformation is taking place in this part. Um, so I believe they're quite competent. They're sandstones. Uh, uh, not high grade metamorphism uh, so they may weather more easily so drilling will tell uh, at the end of the day that's the only way to find out and and what kind of average grades um places it in in the okay it's certainly economic what place it in the okay this is exceptional I, I, one of the best in the world yeah uh, I, th I think if this is a successful program uh, what you have to be keeping your eye on then is if we drill here let's say two meters at three percent copper and as we drill here we drill two meters at three percent copper and this so that we're looking for the predictability of the grade here if it's if it's nuggety if we say oh here we drilled one meter here we drilled half a meter and here we drill 10 meters it's very difficult uh to to use it in mineral calculations right uh, but if we can show the continuity uh, of the style and the grade that's the most important uh, for this style of mineralization. That's a success. Right, uh, yeah. So, so predictable, you don't want 0.5 somewhere and 10% and somewhere else and then uh, varying with, so ideally it's just uniform and yes. just an easy. Yes. Easy so, to extrapolate. Yes, so uh, exactly, easy to extrapolate. And if we can drill it out on uh, 250 to 500 meter spacing, it's, uh, it's an easy exercise and it's not very costly, but if you have to drill it out, on a 25 meter exercise, it becomes uneconomic, right? And then in terms of grades, I mean, what's what's kind of, okay, It's that's a bit of a disappointment. If, if it turns out to look like it's gonna be a, a percent and a half or an, where does it place? What's the kind of very good and what's the okay? Uh, that's a good question. I think 2% uh, with a one ounce of silver, 2% uh, copper and an ounce of silver is, it's, it's, it's okay. We like to go higher, higher grade. Uh, seeing uh, three or four percent would be great uh, depends on how much surface leaching we've had uh, but we'll start at two percent uh, as a sort of a, a modest expectation yeah and then I, I guess just to give people a sense once you're in a particular zone do they tend to be kind of homogenous in terms of grade because uh, to my understanding it does spike and it, it does what you want to see is a floor of pretty high grade, but in certain areas you will get 15%. I mean, it's just- Yes, I think it's highlighted by this slide here, uh, yeah. where we have a 30 meters exposure of this landslide, uh, and sampling every five meters roughly, and we have 14% here. We can see the thickness is quite, con con you know, it's between one and three meters, uh, if you, or one and a half, two to two meters. Uh, the grade is relatively consistent here, but most is actually carried in this channel here. Um, and there will be always be local anomalies like that. But uh, and I, I, when they're spiking to the upside, I don't complain. But uh, minimizing a half meter to one point one, then unless uh, I suppose that's the risk. But you have to account for here this ch challenge in sampling, uh, 
uh, and potential surface leaching. So we'll, we'll have to drill it to find out, but that's the risk. Uh, and if you explain, I mean, the average, the average um, um, depth of the hole would be, or not depth, but distance of the hole would be 200 meters, probably two or 250 or something like that, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's, it's not a very deep program. Uh, some of the deep holes will be 500 meters. Just step out further back to see, to get some width to the to the test as well. But most holes are around 200. And and uh, you're doing 2K first, and, and and 2K that will get you say nine to ten holes. You're able to prove out how big of an area approximately with 2K. And well, uh, the 2Ks will be focusing in on 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 this section here uh, and this section here. And we can do infill if we're successful uh, for another thousand to fifteen hundred meters of drilling uh, in this zone, or we can step further back here, uh, and that's something we'll we'll decide together with Jogmec when we see the results. But two thousand is a minimum, and there's a budget to do more if we're successful. And so, K to two K discretionary based on results. Yeah, and that will infill. Uh, how 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 what, what was the strike of that distance again? Can you repeat that? This is. Uh, this is probably seven kilometers, as you see from this section to this section here. Yeah, so so you could start with fifteen, just doing very wide infill between the two. Uh, yes, uh, the north Ste and the south. Yeah, I I think so. Stepping out uh, initially, proving this two kilometer trend here in the two first yep. two thousand meters, and then we can be bolder and step out and say, let's let's try this one, this one. Uh, yeah, well, I like to drill this hole. I like the structural setting, but it's, it takes a lot of meters to drill a thousand. <laughs> not many, room, not a lot of room for other drill holes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and um, I should this, ask you. Plan okay. Yeah, I was just saying that this drill program, because we, it doesn't, it doesn't expire. If no. we're successful here this year, uh, and we drill this, we can have a new budget from Jogmax saying, let's this year we want to amend this or drill these targets and do something different so it doesn't expire that way if you understand yeah and and um uh, you plan on starting drilling in june or somewhere around there and then yes. the, what's the approximate advance rate uh you know lab assaying time is these parameters quickly uh it will be very fast uh we, we will see me we, each drill hole will have a relatively narrow window for sampling uh we're looking at five meters width, uh, uh, cutting it submitted to the lab, you know, uh, between two weeks and four weeks from okay. we get the drill hole. And, and per day, how many meters do you get through, you think, average? Uh, it will, we will be drilling 24 seven. Uh, uh, so I guess the moves, if we do many moves or we stay on the same platforms, let's let me guess 50 meters per shift, 12 hours, uh, let's say 100 meters a day. Okay. But then we'll, um, the, when we're drilling and then you have some moves, so we'll take it down significantly because the logistics between the platforms will take a few days because we everything is hand carried, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I guess uh, for those that don't know or not familiar with Jogmec, could you explain who they are and what kind of... Uh, what they're looking for with this investment. Yeah, so Jog Jogmec are the arm of the Japanese government. They've just changed their name. Um, they've taken oil and gas. So it was Japanese oil and gas something, but now they've um, made it a little, uh, uh, a little different. And the acronym, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. That's terrible. I'll pull it up maybe while you're asking me another question. But they're, they're basically out of METI, the, the Ministry of the Economy, that that uh, and there's 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 a lot of geologists. They have an office in Peru. They've had an office for forty years, but they're mandated to go and look for metal for the Japanese society and industry, you know, and the big trading houses. Um, so they're the precursor to deals with the trading houses, uh, and so they're they're basically tasked with partnering with companies around the world. For a variety of commodities and you know it used to be the oil and gas but it's not so much that now now it's battery metals much more so uh and and they they they're they want 
to own uh, uh, this project eventually, and they want to then vend it into a into a trading house, one of the trading houses. That's their mandate. They can't hold ground directly, so they need to partner with companies like ourselves, uh, and they, and they structure a deal so they have the majority. So as I said, the seventy five percent, and um, and uh, we manage it for them. We are very much have a, a very close relationship with them. It's uh, you know it's a it, you can imagine um, it's a very strict uh, formal relationship in a Japan cultural sense, you know, from a reporting and budgetary point of view and and um, monthly meetings and and they've just come out and visited just recently. So we have a very, very close relationship with Jogmeg and a very good one. And, and you know, the Japanese are amazingly consistent and, and you've got to listen to every word because it really is very meaningful. So, so I mean, um, to clarify for people, this then game is for them to direct or source source commodities to the big trading houses in 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 Japan. But they are obviously not a an operator or anything of the like. They're a financial partner that looks to secure uh, future commodity flows to Japan. So, at the end of the day, at some point to get this built, or you know, you're not uh, maybe. Uh, I guess we'll see, but Hannon is an exploration company, so you're not intending to build a mega uh, copper sedimentary operation in the Jungle of Peru. No, well, that's the, the difference between something like Southern Cross, where you can get out there and say, yeah. we, we are going to build this, and we have the shareholder base, and it's uh, sort of hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to build it, not the billions, and and, uh, exactly. and that's the difference. So uh, you do need to partner, and... and uh, at some point, um, and there's various points in our very extensive joint venture document with uh, Jogmec, they can take over. I think the first point is actually when they get the 51%, whether they do or not. Um, I um, let let's see. At the moment, you know, we're we're um, we're managing it, um, and and I imagine that would continue until during the expiration phase. I did pull it up during that question. It is the Japan Organization for Metals and Energy Security, Jogmec. That's good. Um, so, so, so I, I guess th they can take control, but either way, whoever is in control at some point when this is more advanced and defined, because obviously this is a massive idea, just like Valiente is, it's a massive idea, so say multi, multi-billion once it's built, if it's proven out, it's two very big, very big ideas. Actually, Valiente is multiple big ideas, I guess. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. but, but either way, I mean, Yogmec would have to find a big mining partner or yourselves would have to, with Yogmec, find a big partner to, to actually develop the project at some point. Um, well, I don't well, know how yourself that would be The trading houses, you know, Sumitomo have operations in their own right. And, uh, but the thing about the Japanese is that they are willing to partner, absolutely. So they wouldn't be opposed to having a, uh, you know, and I'm, I shouldn't, um, I can't speak for them, but I, if you look at their partnerships around the world, having a strong local mining partner too uh, would be um, would be an option for them too. You know, and so the, the, there's there's multiple ways, but they they've structured a joint venture so they have majority control and can make those decisions after they spend thirty five million US. So so where are they now with the spend? How much have they spent so far? Yeah, so they're only they've been in it for uh, this is the third year I I believe, and they've spent uh, around about four million, um, and that's been a lot of that early stage work. And we're just going to start drilling in this new budget, right? And uh, so expenditures will will start to ramp up and and go to two million US a year or a little bit more, so they can get the ideally the eight million was uh, was for four years, but of course we've had to extend that now as we've been waiting for drill permits. So I think it's now at uh, five and maybe go to six years to, to get to that expenditure um, because we're the third year in, but uh, there's four million US to spend over the next three years, basically. Yeah, and uh, I mean, um, you said that the budget would be, the financial year, would, new financial year would, would start at the, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks here, I guess. So when will you have full clarity on how much they intend to spend uh, in the new financial year? Uh, soon, soon. Um, I think within within a week or two, um, literally, because we're getting to that point, right? But uh, uh, it's, um, you know, the Japanese yen is, <laughs> is uh 
has done some funny things. So it, that that has affected their global budgets. So let's just see where it goes. Uh, you know, they reduced from two million US to one point six last year, uh, but this year has got the drilling. So I, I know internally that they they would like to see that uh, go back to two. But uh, let's just see where 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 the decisions are made. So just to clarify, you intend to drill 2,000 meters. Is that something that you're able to do irrespective of, of their budget decision? or uh, Because 2,000 meters should be, I don't know, it, it, how much does that equate to? It should be uh, oh, no it's... more than a million bucks, no? Something no, it's a, yeah, I think it's about uh, we're budgeting something like... Um... Uh, 270 US, I think, is the. You ask Lars; he's been through oh, okay, the, okay. the exact numbers. But uh, that's that. Uh, there's actually room to drill another 2,000 meters on top of that. Uh, 2,000 yes. to 4,000 in total. So uh, let, let's just see where it goes geologically, and then um, and then we've got the the room to play with with budget and and geology to to drill those four thousand meters but it needs those you, you don't commit to the bigger budget until you this is the first up drill test so we need to see the rocks and the results and if i recall uh, i mean it how much does it just cost to maintain the the, the vast land, land package there annually yeah so it's about uh well jogmec look after all their ground right um so it's 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 three US dollars per hectare. Uh, in our own ground, it's something like three hundred and fifty thousand US dollars. Um, so you, 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 we're spending. Where I said we're basically spending a million Canadian on the work, but it's another half a million Canadian almost on the ground holding. Um, so yeah. that's that was I I I I missed that uh, when I was describing the the burn there, but. Uh, and then about another half a million bucks to to run the company, so it's two million of our own bucks a year that we we spend. But so the ground holding in Peru is debilitatingly uh, hard for for most, um, especially when you're going into big ground positions like we have. But but we're nothing without that ground position. It means we have to turn over ground quickly and and move as quickly as you can. And that, with slow drill permitting, that's a bit harder, but at least uh, you can do that initial filtering. And we, we have rationalized, you know, some ground based on the magnetics and the, the stream sediment sampling. So now we've just really got the core uh, parts of the system um, and, uh, you know, 1600 kilometers all up and a uh, thousand of those are at Valiente. Yeah, and I remind myself here to get back to speaking about what what it would take, you know, for, to potentially increase the drilling at uh, uh, at San Vicente. We'll get back to that. San, so San, Martin, San Martin, San Martin, San, San Martin, Martin. Sorry, San, San Vicente Martin. is in, in Bolivia. <laughs> well, it's also in in Peru. There's a base metal mine and a zinc mine uh, called San Vicente. So, uh, it, yeah. it it Sorry. it it's probably going to be in the budget, and and it will be discretionary. So we, I can't talk to you about the the final Jogmec budget until the Japanese government no, no. approves it. But if if it is as we uh, believe it is going to be, the two million US, then there's room for four kilometers of drilling. And uh, and if it's not, then then and then it'll probably come back to the two. But we need to really see whether the target holds up where we're where we're we're drilling it. I mentioned that we've got one point nine meters at two percent copper that looks continuous, but it has that carbon that looks looks to me to be a bit variable. So I think that uh, that's a little bit of a challenge for that part of the project. But then when we go across to Sorator, where we're not drilling because we don't have the permits there yet. But we've got that sour gas, much thicker, 10 to 20 metre thick horizon. You can develop targets, well, tonnes a lot quicker. The, it's highly leached and we're getting very high grade copper there. So that to me is arguably a better geological target. Um, but, you know, I've been wrong many times before and you've got to drill these targets and see. So let's drill the 2,000 metres and see. Um, and um, and I hope I'm very wrong and we see nice consistency and we, we move ahead and just drill more and more. And, you know, the target uh, is something like if, if that whole DIA area, which is about 12 kilometres, comes in, I think it's about 120 million tonnes of copper, that, uh, 120 million tonnes of rock that we can drill uh, in, in that area, which is, you know, a significant target, is, which is which is Jogmec's minimum um, target size um, that they're looking for. So in one very small 
part of the whole permit. Um, and if it stacks up in the first drill tar- permit area, we, 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 we hit their minimum threshold straight up. So let, let's see, but there's, there's, there's a hell of a lot more to, to be done than just that one drill target. But uh, it was a, such a watershed permit for us because if we hadn't got that first one, it would be hard to tell you that we're going to get the next one and the next one and the next one. But And, and we're learning too about how to apply for what what the authorities want the authorities are learning because these are new areas that just haven't been drill permitted before so they're slightly different areas and and they've got uh, uh people and authorities who've never had to deal with exploration even though it's only you know 80 kilometers uh east of you know where some of the most prolific mines in the world it's a, it's it's a long way in terms of those other factors um so getting back to san martin what would you say a success looks like because this is not a people know porphyrys more or less i think i guess people have some experience with with uh, sediment hosted copper copper deposits but can, can you explain what or what are the important things i mean continuity is important that, that you don't drop down to half a percent somewhere you're at 14 percent so but you want to have that stability but it's also kind of the the the, the general thickness of of the uh of the pancake that it's just consistency to my understanding but maybe you can can explain what a successful say initial 2000 meters looks like and what a successful district looks like as well so jogbeck jv is the pancake a sediment hosted system and and you can only afford to drill these systems because you need because they're quite skinny but they're long so you need to drill them at two to four hundred meter centers they will vary in grade at you know over that that whole system no doubt and and that's been Friedland's success at Kalmoa, um, finding the very high grade parts where that system's been at, on lapping onto the edge of a basin. Um, so, uh, but what I mean is you drill a drill hole 200 metres away from each other and, and you can be confident of the continuity because we can't afford to drill it at 10 metre spacing, basically. So, um, because it's not the type of target that can do that. So, so consistency, a low CV, a coefficient of variation, a low CV. Um, and and um, and and a grade that will work if 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 our surface channels are anything to go by and that consistency is there, you know we're very much in the ballpark, right? A meter at a couple of percent. If it's flat, you don't want it to be steep because steep mining is hard in skinny little bodies. But you can go along a pancake and mine it like that um, very consistently. So you want these. Uh, to be relatively flat lying, which they appear to be. We know that and we've got the seismics and we've got a lot of mapping that suggests that. So we'll stay away from any of the steeper areas um, also. So it's all around the shape of the, the, the body. Uh, and um, and like I said, we're trying to find the thicker, higher grade parts of the system, which I, I know we've got out there at Sorator with that new discovery is is very much to me what um, success looks like in that system, actually. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I very much like that new area a bit earlier. Um, we've got a lot more work to do out there, and, and we're not permitted to drill that in another few months. Um, but that that's the kind of thing that we've been looking for. And, and just to answer your question, perhaps the porphyries, there's 18 at least of them, if not more. Success will be just the grade. There's no doubt that um, that uh, the systems are there. There's, there is absolutely no doubt. But what will be the grade of those porphyries? Are they 0.3 porphyries? Are they 0.7% porphyries and, or, or, or above? And, you know, if you get a 0.7% equivalent porphyry and you've got hundreds of millions of tonnes of that, you're onto it. <laughs> um, if you're at 0.3, you're really struggling because there's no shortage of porphyries lined up in the world that are lower grade. But that's the problem with the copper industry today is that that uh, the 10 major projects that are being mined today are the same that were being mined 10 years ago, but their grades have halved, so their tonnages have doubled. Um, and and we're not making those higher grade discoveries. I do like the, the, the sediment hosted system because the footprint is a lot lower. Um, and, um, you know, from an environmental point of view, you can go under and mine this pancake and just have access and a lot, a lot of the, the uh, work happens in an underground environment rather than a porphyry that typically is a big hole in the ground, right? So um, let, let's just see where they go. Maybe, you know, there's, there's porphyries like the Sol Gold porphyry in Ecuador that has the core high grade part um, 
much deeper, so they have to make it a big block cave exercise um, at, at, at depth. So we, you know, we just don't know where the grade will partition in, in those porphyries, but success will be 0.7% uh, copper equivalent and, and uh, in any one of those porphyries. And the beautiful thing is we've got so many to test. We want to get onto the best one first, of course, but um, and, and, and like I said, I really like that previous still area. That is looking the bomb in terms of what we're seeing in, in, in surface indications there. That, that really has some... Um, that, 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 gets the geologist excited but i, I mean with, with the sediment host that i mean it's the grade it's the continuity but how, how does topography play into it does it matter a lot uh, um i mean you're talking about faults and, and breakups and stuff like this uh, what what other characteristics are important for you know the people of the industry look at to know that this is okay this is a bona fide you know, really economic sedimentary host, copper host, and uh, you know, system that you're dealing with there. Is there anything that lay investors might not think about? Yes, yeah, so it, it's a really good question. Uh, the 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 skepticism, I suppose, is the other way to uh, answer that is that uh, that we can get there and drill it. Okay, bang. You know, we were told that we'd never get a drill permit when we first went there by by people who hadn't worked in those areas and didn't see the opportunity. So bang, you've got to drill uh, to test these things. So we've, we've got to got almost to that point, right? Um, and, and, and we've got the big permit in hand. The, the consistency of grade and not having to drill it at close drill spacing is absolutely, for me, the, the key risk. That's my scepticism. Um, whereas I like the sour gas target for the consistency of that mineralization rather than broken up plant material that uh, tends to be more variable and so the carbon that acts as the reductant. So the, the variability of the carbon is the variability of the copper. Um, the morphology, the mineability of it, you want uh, to be good ground conditions in the hanging wall, especially if you're going to only mine a metre wide thing and go along it, you don't want the roof to be unstable. So, you know, we will see when we drill um, the rock formation, we only know from, you know, the, the, the surface and we know the facies variation around the copper very well. The guys have been very good at looking. Facies variation is the, just the difference in the, the different characteristics of the rock going from a siltstone to a sandstone to um, just where the rocks and how they were formed. And, and, and we, we know that it forms in a big base and transition going from uh, flu, uh, from a, a, a marine to terrestrial. So it's got a great location in the basins, all those things, but that doesn't help you mine it. Um, but, uh, and then, and then, uh, and, and then, uh, you don't want it to be faulted. So you're going along and then you have to drop down two meters. So you want the, the, the zone to be consistent and, and not broken up. We are staying around, like I said, the flat areas. We know that it, you know, we, we can map at one side of a mountain to the other, the same horizon. And, you know, that might be 500 meters between. So there's some very good evidence. Basically we've got the topography is essentially pseudo drill holes for us, right? To, to, um, to join the dots, but, but um, yeah, let's drill it. Let's drill it. And that's what we need to do in every deposit. That's no, no, no secret. But this this slide is important because of this slide. So why is Cerro Orlando important? Uh, this is not a random location. This is located on this western, northwestern, southeastern lineament that has been mapped historically. Uh, and uh, within this uh, trend here, you're in the Atacama deserts in the Pampas is all buried. So it's more difficult to map these fault trends. Uh, but there's gravity uh, and magnetic data that suggests that there are interference patterns uh, or basin faults that are cross-cutting this here. So in that aspect, this location doesn't look too different from Chucky or Escondida, but it's uh, that's the big picture thinking, right? We like it because it has a good geophysical target, a magnetic anomaly and a conductor um, that is coinciding with this lineament. We know it like it because it's shallow. This fast permitting, it is a low cost test. And it gives our shareholders uh, a bit of excitement while we wait for the for the uh, drilling in Valiente as well. So having a look at this this image here, this is showing you the conductor and the magnetic anomaly. We did this survey last year, and the conductor is uh, is is quite good actually. Uh, when you look at the scale, this is a two kilometer scale here, uh, scale bar, 
Uh, these magenta colored areas are the best conductors within the survey area. Uh, we can see it here, we can see it on this side here, uh, and we can see it on this side here. This is fault here. We believe that fault is a part of this major fault zone. You know, a fault is not a single line, but it's a series of dis discontinuities in the bedrock. But this fault here is a part of that. We can actually see it on the surface, so it's uh, probably active during seismic events as well. Uh, that's offsetting this, this uh, conductor, as you see here. That conductor sits quite shallowly, 60 meters depth. Uh, why do you have a conductor at 60 meters depth? It's probably because of a sulfide, uh, uh, a, a leach sulfide blanket or a super gene enrichment uh, in the, in, in the, uh, at the top of the bedrock. Uh, so the model is developing this environment where you see porphyry, leaching, super gene enrichment, and then you have the hypogene mineralization below uh, that we see elsewhere in the, uh, uh, in the, in the Atacama Basin. And interestingly, uh, we can test this model very cheaply. We don't have to drill four or 500 meters down into the, the core of the institution. We can only drill this super gene blanket. And if that model holds up, that is copper and we're into the bedrock, then we know that our porphyry model here works. So it's, it's a cheap test and exposing us to something much bigger. Uh, below this conductor, uh, we have the magnetic anomaly that's shown here as a, a modeled. That blob is directly under this, this here. Uh, and to drill that, you probably have to extend the hole to 500 meters. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, obviously here, I mean, it, it's discretionary. If you guys intersect the or verify the hypothesis of the, of the super gene blanket, yes, then you have a system. Then you continue down to test the deeper uh, anomaly as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and more precise timing, approximately, when do you plan to be on site? Uh, I think it will happen. Uh, my most realistic expectation is uh, May, uh, June. We're going through the uh, the permitting stage now. It's easy permitting uh, for this program, and we're getting the agreement with the community that is in the area, and that's also very standardized in Chile. It's not like uh, Peru. Uh, so there are a few formal loopholes. We're talking with a drill contractor because this is a micro program. The biggest challenge here was to find a contractor, but uh, we have found one that is drilling for another company nearby, and they will they will drill this um, micro <laughs> program for us uh, when we're ready. Okay, uh, and we should speak about Cerro Rolando. I mean, it, it's it's kind of like uh, your uh, for Lars describing it. it it's essentially it's a drill ready target. Um, it could be. A coincidence, it could look like a target, it could be a red herring, I guess, but now you've decided to just shoot through the pampa and test, test the target and see if you have something there. So what's the ability? If you hit something, um, first of all, you're doing 150 meters. Are you confident that you're going to break through into the target with, with that, uh, uh, that kind of meterage? And uh, if you hit something, can you continue? Do you have the financial strength to do that? Or what's the plan to follow up if, if you hit? Yeah, absolutely. We have the financial strength if we hit a porphyry under 100 metres in Chile in elephant country um, and it's got the grade there, um, absolutely we'll, we'll be able to fund that. Uh, but uh, the question is, how thick is that pamper? And we have a conductor at about 60 to 80 metres only, shallow beneath the surface. That conductor could be salt water but it doesn't look like it geophysically. This response doesn't look like salty water. And, and if it's not that, it, it could very well be a, an enriched chalcosite blanket. There is a big conductor, big conductor at 400 metres. That looks like salty water. <laughs> so, it, um, But uh, it's also flat lying, which would imply that it might still be in the pamper, right, rather than just in fractures in, in, in the basement. So... Uh, and then we've got a, a, a very big magnetic anomaly coincidentally below the, the, the shallow conductor that we like. 
and below the, the big conductor, but we're sort of writing that off at 400 meters as probably uh, salty water. So we just want to know if that top conductor has copper and we want to know if we go through the pamper into the the, bait, the rock because the pamper will be covering the porphyry um, and, uh, and, and that enrichment. So if we drill hard rock and we get a copper anomaly in that that's chalcosite and looks like a, a super gene blanket that's game on, um, if we just stop and hit, uh, you know, gravels and uh, we don't get any anomalism of copper, then it's too hard. I mean, the, 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 the magnetic anomaly looks like an intrusive and, and could be, it, well, it is an intrusive rock. It's got magnetite in it. Um, whether it's a porphyry or not, um, we don't know because it's down there, but we're not chasing a, a very deep magnetic target down to seven or 800 meters. That, 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 that's, uh, that's not the way to fame and fortune, especially with what we've got in Peru. So we, we figure that just a, a cheap, uh, Lars calls it a micro tool program, um, but it's really just a, 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 it's just a geochemical test beneath you know, 60 to 80 meters of what we hope is only the, the, um, the pamper. So, you know, great bang for buck optionality, but you know, it's not going to, you know, I think it's 120,000 bucks or something uh, Canadian to, to, to test that and move on. So it's, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very low cost swing at the dive of hitting a, hitting a, a porphyry in Chile. But, but that's using a, some, some kind of small rig, like a scout or, or, or are you using a real, real rig? Pro proper rig, a <laughs> big rig. To, proper you, rig. Need, you need a proper rig to get through those gravels and make sure the hole doesn't collapse. So uh, it certainly that needs um, you know, very, very experienced drillers and, um, and, and a proper uh, rig to, to uh, keep the hole open and, and get down to get to that down to that target. It's it's a high yeah, risk. I mean, it, no, but doubt. But if it was a half a million dollars to test, I doubt we'd test it. But because it's a hundred, it's worth the swing. Yeah, you, you can you can kind of verify the worthwhileness of target for a small investment. And if you hit a blanket and you're able to see that with the XRF guns and visuals, obviously, mm -hmm. do you then? What I mean with, yes, you could race, you could wait for the assays, then you could race and then you can continue drilling, but can you extend this hole even further? If you hit oh, the blank, do you then just keep on going? A a absolutely. If Lars is on the rig and he says, Mike, <laughs> we've got we've got copper coming out of our yin yang and uh and we've hit it <laughs> and uh we need to keep drilling, it's no it's not don't stop, it's keep going. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 no doubt. Yeah, that's no, a good question, but <laughs> that uh, that that wouldn't be a hard decision. Okay, okay, perfect. And uh, I, I guess to ask you, like this time next year, what would you say have been a good outcome? You you would have tested Cerro Land, you would have done the hopefully four K then at mm. at uh, San Martin, not San Vicente. And then uh, at Valiente, you would be very close, or if it goes very well, you might already be mobilizing to start drilling potentially. It's it's in the cards, I guess. Uh, March timeframe, Q1, end of Q1 next year. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I'd like to have seen us had success at San Martin. I'd like to uh, def, uh, define that Sorator target further and have the DIA in for that area, which is the that's the Jogmec uh, JV. And and maybe you know we could be well we could still be drilling you know if if things are going well at San Martin right because there's a forty platforms yep. and, and a twenty kilometer or twelve kilometer long system then um, then in uh, um, Valiente we've we've got the permit or very close to getting the permit and remember Peru is getting quicker at these things it's actually um, making making I mean I know I've, I've been talking with the very highest levels of government and at every point they tell us that they want investment and they want to support us. And we're seeing that we had, we had the new minister of mines go to Sorator and visit the mayor there just over the last few weeks. Um, we, we um, you know, and I met him only at PDAC and, and they've got a very, they understand that mining is the future and the way to unlock, um, you know, unlock the, the, disproportionate poverty and, and wealth that is Lima and, and, and that's not in the regions and, and, and create those jobs with responsible explorers and miners, right? And that's, they're very clear about that also. Um, so 
So things are getting better. So yeah, let's 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 say that Valiente is going to be very close, if not permitted. We're going to have absolutely a deer or even a faster permit in the system at uh, Prevista. We're going through that now. We haven't talked about that, but there are faster permits than the two-year deer. Um, but we're going and and we've got a biologist on the ground defining the areas you can't be around any agricultural areas. You can't be around any pristine. Uh, forest areas, certainly no pristine forest areas where we're working, but uh, there's there's people with agriculture. So we've just got to balance off where we want to drill in, in previous and see if we can get a, a drill hole in the ground there quicker. Uh, we'll have a deer there at least. Um, there's a there's the divisoria. We didn't talk about that, but we've we've done a lot of the pre-work to get the deer in there. So I hope we've got three deers uh, in the system there and, and, and getting close or just about to start drilling. And, and once we get, you know, we've gone through the hard yards, we're going to have drilling every year on a different porphyry and, and San Martin will work itself out. And, and, um, and, and then we'll be folk, we'll, 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 we'll just got to get onto the best parts of the system early on rather than taking the fifth or sixth porphyry to work out where the best one is. And, and I think I know where that is today based on the surface work and, and notwithstanding, I, Berlin is a very valid target, but the, that previous area just looks fantastic. I've said that three times now, but uh, it really does. And then I um, always ask as well, the, the long, longer term vision. So in five years from now, what's your, you know, within that time frame, you're able to prove a lot of these things out. Where can you see or where do you want to see happen at that point? Well, at a much larger market cap than twenty or thirty million dollars, and and uh, and that goes without saying. But that will only come through success of the drill bit. And you know, we know how to make discoveries. There's no doubt about that. And 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 that's that's what we're good at. Uh, if we're good at anything, that's what we're good at. And so, you know, we 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 hopefully will have. Uh, Jogmex satisfied and and have earned its fifty one percent and moving forward uh, fully funding that project and 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 finding the best parts of that system uh, and and they'd be drilling out their their system there and you know it's um, it's because because uh, in five years we'll be probably three years into drilling their best system with it uh, I think at Sorotor there's a there's a prediction and and then um, and then we've got at, at, at least. Uh, an inferred large resource on on a porphyry uh, will be really interesting where we go and where we joint venture. You know, you may we may joint venture the porphyries because they're big company targets. Say, yeah, once we've drilled one, we don't want to spend all the capital drilling out one. So it may be better to joint venture a porphyry earlier. Whereas the gold epithermal targets, you know, if we're onto a high grade gold system, we know what they do to to uh, share prices. So we may focus equally on the epithermal parts of the systems and have joint ventured, you know, the, the porphyries as well. So let's just see where we go. But I hope we've got two porphyries and Jogmec are working their way to, to, to 150 to 200 million tonnes of copper uh, uh, rock at uh, 2% plus um, up in San Martin. Excellent, Mike. Pleasure as always. And uh, I'm following intently here for sure. <laughs> Keep your eye on it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting company.